you need to ask yourself, are you ready for the journey? Are you ready for the hard work? Are you ready to make sacrifices? Running a business can be tough, so it makes sense that managing your business accounts shouldn't get in the way of what you do best. But it's easy with Sage Accounting Tools on your smartphone, your tablet, or your laptop. It's accounting for wherever you are on your business journey. Go to sage.co.uk forward slash journey. Sage, accounting for the journey. It's that time of the week when former football and sports stars share their stories. It happens all right here, right now, on Thursday Night Tailgate, with your hosts, Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari. Guys, have some fun. Enjoy the guests. Take it away. Hey, thank you, Joe. Greetings, everybody, and thank you for coming back and making Thursday Night Tailgate a part of your week. We're your home, we're your home for interviews and conversations. You know, with the greatest players in the history of the NFL and home of the NFL Alumni Association and the Gridiron Greats. Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari, we're here with you for the next couple of hours. TNT is brought to you tonight by the great folks over at Kyvin Foods, Coastal Orthopedics, the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory, and the French Lick Resort. Tonight, Bob and I, we got five great guests that we are looking forward to sharing with you. First up tonight is going to be former Rangers, Yankees, and Braves outfielder Billy Sample. Billy is always a lot of fun for us to have on this show. He's always got a lot of funny stories to share. And speaking of funny, Billy has now started doing some stand-up comedy. So we'll hear how that's going, plus a whole lot more when Billy joins us here in just about 15 minutes. At the bottom of the hour, like we always do, we'll go through our five-star picks of the week with former Patriots Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins. Following Tony, former Eagles Pro Bowl defensive back Lito Shepard is going to be making his TNT debut with us. He's a, he's a guy who just has tortured the Cowboys over the course of his career. He set an NFL record against the Cowboys, having returned two interceptions for over 100 yards, uh, one back in 2004 and did it again in 2006. So we're looking forward to hearing those stories and a whole lot more when he joins us later on in this hour. We'll kick off hour number two with a return visit from our good friend Musa Muhammad. Musa has been a great friend of the show over the last several years, and uh, both here on the radio side and on the TV side with Bob and, uh, and our good friend Tony D'Angelo. We're going to get Moose's thoughts on his former teams, the Panthers and the Bears, as well as his alma mater, Michigan State, when he joins us about an hour from now. And then we'll round out the show with a guy who always gives it to us straight, former Jets and uh, Dolphins defensive back, Kerry Glenn. Be prepared to hear some strong opinions when Kerry joins us about 90 minutes from now. So we've got another great show in store for you tonight. So sit back, relax, let us take your mind off everything else uh, going on in your life over the next couple of hours. But uh, we'll kick off the show like we do every single week, and that is by bringing in my co-host, Mr. Bob Lazari. Bob, how are you tonight, my friend? I'm okay. How's everything with you, Chris? Going really well, thank you, sir. Good. So, uh, Bob, before you know, we get into you know the, the show with our guests and that sort of thing, I like to go around the league with you a little bit, and you know, uh, it's certainly been a very busy week in the NFL. The you know the biggest news was the Rams finally letting go of uh, you know Jeff Fisher after a, uh, a blowout loss last Sunday to, to the Falcons. And, you know, Bob, this is something that you and I have been sort of talking about, wondering about, you know, for the last several weeks. The Rams are 4-9 and nine now. They're 33-45-1 and one in the, under Jeff Fisher over the last several years. And his 21 years, Bob, as a head coach, six winning seasons, he's now tied for the most losses ever as an NFL ho- uh, coach, Bob. And, you know, I, I think, you know, certainly you go back and you look at, you know, his resume, a really good defensive coach. And maybe people don't remember that, you know, he was with the Bears back in the early 80s. He was on the roster with the 85 Bears when they won the Super Bowl, though he was on IR with an ankle injury that season. And as an interesting side note, he also suffered a broken leg in 1983 on a punt return when he was tackled by Bill Cower when Cower was uh, playing for the Eagles. But anyway, Bob, curious to get your thoughts. Thoughts on the Rams firing Jeff Fisher this week? Well, like you said, Chris, you and I have been dumbfounded all year long um, as when all the extension talks is 
the talks came out, and you and I were were basically waiting for the hammer to drop here, not wishing it on him, but saying, my goodness, you know, the way we see the coaching carousel in the NFL now, this guy is stuck around 22 years as a head coach. And uh, seriously, Chris, I was looking at his record this afternoon. Out of the 22 years, there's really only – I only counted about five of them that you can count – you could consider them really, really good years. And that's pretty – that's pretty telling when you come uh, and when you talk about a uh, head coach's resume. And uh, as you know, uh, he hasn't had anything going on really good in about the last eight or nine years. And um, so that was just, it was crazy when you and I heard extensions or, you know, it was early in the year I had said, you know, this guy has got to be on the chopping block. I think guys like him, and you and I have talked a lot about this. Guys of him, like him, are, are kind of your typical coordinators that probably should have stayed coordinators. But, of course, Chris, the money comes and the ego comes, and this guy could have uh, probably had a heck of a lot more success being a coordinator for whoever he wanted. But uh, chose the head coaching rank, and it's understandable, obviously. But, uh, again, since uh, it's one one conference championship that was way back in 99 but nothing in the postseason since and um, you know I I don't want to say it's been a long time coming but uh, there's a lot of guys that have been let go that probably deserve to be around longer than Jeff Fisher and uh, again uh, I think he's a great defensive minded guy and if he wants will remain on his feet as a coordinator anywhere he wants but uh just not a head coach in this league, Chris. I truly believe that. Yeah, you know, Bob, I mean, you know, certainly his defenses, and we've seen it, you know, the last several years with the Rams. Rams, really good defenses, you know, but, uh, you know, have just struggled mightily on offense. And, you know, as a head coach, you know, part of the role, right, is any good, you know, manager of, a, of, a, of an organization, you know, you've got to bring in, you know, really good people under you, and you would think you, you, you could find a really good offensive mind. But uh, that is certainly where the Rams have struggled and, and uh, struggled again this year. And, you know, it's, you know that's, you know, they went to, went to Goff and trying to get something going or at least get him some experience. Hopefully he's the guy for the Rams as they get into the future, right? First-round draft pick, number one pick overall. So they're trying to get, you know, get him going now. But, boy, they just struggled getting points on the board, and, it, you know, obviously it's uh, now cost him his job. But, yeah, I'm with you, Bob. He's, he's a guy that I've said for years must have a picture of uh, somebody in a bunny suit to think that, uh, you know, he could continue to have losing season after losing season after losing season and uh, and maintain jobs or get jobs. So, it, yeah, to your point, I think he, he lands very easily as a defensive coordinator in the not-too-distant future. But, Bob, you know, he, he's not certainly the only – head coach that's uh you know that's feeling i think uh the heat right now and as, as you know as we look ahead to other potential coaching you know openings and you know black monday is uh looming you know not all that far off onto the horizon right the monday after the regular season ends is typically when we see a lot of movement uh you know, for, for coaches and coaching staffs do you expect more vacancies though bob to arise when you look around into like the jacksonville's and the buffaloes and the san diego's and maybe even cincinnati this year other other uh, coaching vacancies that uh, you think are going to come open here in the next few weeks Absolutely, Chris. There's there's going to be heads rolling. Um, as you know, the patience of these owners is uh, is at an all time low, and uh, just going the teams you had just mentioned, guys like Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Gus Bradley, Chris. In the four years he's been there, he's hasn't won even a third of the games he's coached. And that was a team I know you thought highly of this year, and I think we yeah. both thought would do much better than, than they've done. Two and eleven. Uh, again, this is a guy whose lifetime record, Chris, 14 and 47. He will be gone. A guy like Rex Ryan. I think people are getting sick of his 500 type years, Chris. When 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 you're supposed to be a playoff team and he ends up being 500. Uh, you know, guys, 60 and 65 lifetime, 500 in Buffalo. This that just doesn't get it done in the NFL. Again, another guy I think is just a coordinator. San Diego McCoy started out good, Chris. 27 and 34 lifetime, not going anywhere this year. I think he'll be going. The Jets with Bowles, I know he's liked up here, but he's another defensive kind of coach who probably should be a coordinator somewhere. Again, uh, uh, this is a guy that's probably – they may give him another year, Chris, if they try to fix this quarterback situation. I'm not sure. Chip Kelly, 
Again, started out good, Chris. Now he's under 500 with the awful year they're having. Again, a guy known for his offense is just not getting it done. He may go. John Fox, a guy like that, he's got a resume uh, having a bad year. They may give him, if he wants to stick around him, he'll, he'll be the guy that probably gets uh, uh, probably – uh, another year if he wants it. Uh, this is a guy that's been to the postseason. And, and, uh, but all these guys, as we mentioned, every guy I just mentioned, Chris, was known for being a great coordinator. But guess what? Average coaches. So that must tell you something. Yeah, absolutely right. And, Bob, you know, you, you know the, the one that you didn't mention that you know, I, I've sort of been wondering about for years is, is Marvin Lewis in Cincinnati, a guy that – you know, for so many years, it seemed like he had lost, you know, organizational control with all the with the number of arrests, you know, that happened with guys on their roster. And uh, they certainly turned it around, and they were patient with him. And he's gone to, you know, gone to the postseason in the last several years. Hasn't gotten a win in the postseason, but at least he's gotten them there. And uh, you know, this year certainly a down year for them. You know, could they get back to 500? Yes, they're five, seven, and one. So yeah, they could get back to 500. But um, at some point, you got to wonder, you know, how long, how long is Marvin Lewis's leash in Cincinnati? I think he's, a, he's an interesting guy to watch, and it'll be interesting to see if the, if the Bengals look and say, you know what, he's a guy that, you know, he, he certainly got us into the postseason, a place that the Bengals hadn't been, you know, for over a decade. He got him there. Unfortunately, yeah. hasn't been able to get him over the hump and get him a win, and he's not going to get him over the hump and get him a win this year either. So you got to wonder what uh, what his uh, future might be uh, come uh, a couple of weeks from now on Black Monday. Great point. Long tenured coach. I'd like to have him, Jeff Fisher, and Gus Bradley on my defensive staff. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. Uh, you're right. Bob, as I was, you know, looking over, you know, some of the things related to some, you know, potential coaching, you know, changes, you know, here's a thing to know about the Bills and their quarterback, Tyrod Taylor, and his contract. As part of the contract extension that he signed just back in August, Bob, the Bills guarantee Taylor about $30 million if he remains on the roster by the fourth day of the 2017 league season, which begins in March. He's also guaranteed a $27.5 million base salary in 2017 if by some reason he happens to suffer an injury that prevents him from playing next year. So you'd have to believe, wouldn't you, Bob, that you know, he, he can't be on this roster in March, can he? he no. Pay $30 million no. to Tyrod Taylor, really? Uh, when it happened, Chris, again, you and I kind of looked at each other and said, uh, you know, can he prove himself? I mean, I don't know what they're looking for. You know, when you and I had had the same type of outlook on it, you know, a kind of a Michael Vick kind of guy, is he going to be as good as Vick? Is he going to be able to throw the ball? Is he going to be able to play under that offense and defense in Buffalo? Uh, none of us was convinced. And, and, again, he's done really nothing up, up to now that's, uh, that puts you in, like, the top – here of NFL quarterbacks, Chris. I don't understand it. I do not. I know our friend Angelo Kane doesn't understand it. We can go on and on, but um, yeah, I, if he's playing, if he's not a backup somewhere uh, at this time next year, I'd be shocked. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, just the, the idea, right, you know, and, and certainly some of, you know, Tyrod had a nice year last year, and he was, you know, towards the, the upper half, you know, probably in the top ten when you look at, you know, quarterback rating and, and some of the, you know, completion percentage certainly had a, you know, had a really nice year. He got injured for a few games, but still had a pretty nice year. And, you know, hey, do you know, could you continue to develop him and he could be a good quarterback in this league? Absolutely. I think mm-hmm. the talent is there. At a $30 million price tag? I, I, you know, that just boggles my mind. I just can't imagine, you know, even when they were putting this thing together, you know, who signed off on that? We're going to, we're really going to offer Tyrod Taylor. The guys had one year starting in this league and we've seen crazy stuff, right? With quarterbacks throughout the years, guys get, you know, huge dollars based on a couple of games, right? Brock Osweiler immediately comes to mind, right? Guys got, you know, played seven games. All of a sudden he's a 20 plus million dollar quarterback, right? So they do sort of the same thing with Tyrod Taylor. Um, that's, it's a head scratcher to me. I can't imagine he's a Buffalo Bill uh, come uh, mid-March of uh, next year. Yeah. One thing's for sure, One more he has a great Bob. agent. <laughs> That's exactly right. One more thing, Bob, and, you know, as we talked a moment ago about Fisher's problems, you know, about, you know, on, on the offensive side, you look now, you know, on the opposite side of that, Bob, is Sean Payton in New Orleans. I think many of us have just been dazzled 
by the points, you know, that he and Drew Brees have, you know, come together to, you know, that offense and how many points they score every week. But, you know, you look back over the last five seasons, Bob, one winning season in the last five, their defense has been ranked better than 28th, 28th now, 32 teams, right? Better than 28th only once, you know, and over his tenure, you know, he's now in his 11th season as head coach there. They've been in the top half of the, you know, the defenses and top half of the rankings only four times in 11 years. So they were dead last last year. They've improved all the way to 30th so far this year. And Bob, you know, Drew Brees, he's going to be 38 years old come January 15th. So they need to win now, need to win next season. So curious to get your thoughts on Sean Payton in New Orleans. Is he safe? They, they may give him one more year, Chris, but you're right. This is a guy on the downslide, uh, hasn't won double figures since 2013. Last, well, if you count this year, team, they have a very good chance of finishing under 500, Chris. So that would be three seasons in a row they have not finished above 500. And this is a team that was used to being five, six, seven games above, of course, winning a Super Bowl. Guy, that, that automatically keeps a coach in the job for another five years if he wants it. But uh, you might be right. I mean, if, if Breeze comes back for one more year, they may say, look, get, do something with this defense. We know he can score points, but we're going to give you one more year with the defense. It'll probably be Breeze's last hurrah. It'll be your last hurrah. We'll see what they can do next year. But uh, you're right, Chris. When you have three seasons in this league under 500, when you're supposed to be an offensive juggernaut, that's not going to get it done. That's right. All right, everyone, like we do here every week on Thursday Night Tailgate, we want to send out a big thank you to our military personnel listening in around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network. We cannot say thank you enough for doing what you do to protect all of us in our way of life. For everyone else that's listening in tonight on the station or the app of your choice, we certainly appreciate you very much, and we hope you'll join us in thanking our brave men and women that are out there serving in our military. If you happen to see one of them out in your daily life, wherever you might be, grocery store, airport, restaurant, you know, wherever you are, please stop for a moment and tell them thank you. Those folks are our true heroes. We also want to thank our veterans for your service and the sacrifices that you and your families have made for us over the years. And a big thank you as well to Sean Cruz and all the wonderful folks over at the Armed Forces Radio Network. It is such an honor for us to have Thursday Night Tailgate as a part of your network. You can find our show by going to armedforcesradionetwork.org. And veterans, please continue to check out globalvoiceforveterans.org. want to remind you again this week, we remind you every week, what a great site with news and articles that are both interesting and beneficial and geared specifically towards our veterans out there. Again, globalvoiceforveterans.org. TNT is sponsored by Kyvan Foods. NFL star Reggie Kelly brings his authentic flavor of traditional southern cooking to market with his Kyvan Food products. Made with the finest ingredients, Kyvan Foods encourages you to appreciate the goodness of the exceptional flavors that they have in their salsas, sauces, apple butter, and their other fine products. Many of Kyvan products are all natural, and they just taste absolutely spectacular. Kyvan items are, you know, terrific for your holiday parties, having your friends over, right, for, for the holidays, for the New Year's Eve uh, celebration as well. You can order uh, Kyvan products online through Amazon or through their own website, kyvan82.com, and Kyvan is spelled K-Y-V-A-N. TNT is also sponsored tonight by Dr. Peter Candelora and the great folks over at Coastal Orthopedics. And, folks, if you're an athlete or a weekend warrior and you're dealing with injuries or discomfort, wherever it might be, in your knees, your shoulders, your hips, any of your joints, don't just live with it. Do what the other athletes do to get relief, and that is contact Dr. Peter Candelora. He can get you back to enjoying life. For more information or to schedule a consultation, visit them online at athleteinjuries.com. Baseball season, right? It's over, unfortunately. But if you love the game, you've got to go check out the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory. They were inducted recently into the TripAdvisor Certificate of Excellence Hall of Fame. The museum is a very cool experience for everybody in your family because you get to go out there and you get to walk their live production line, see the bats being made right there in front of you. 1.8 million bats they make each year. And they still have the Ripley's Believe It or Not exhibit. you got some bizarre baseball treasures you get to check out. And don't miss the bat vault where you get to actually hold game-used bats from so many of the game's greatest legends. Guys like Hank Aaron, Ted Williams, my hero growing up, Willie Stargell as well. To find out more information about the museum and to book your visit, go to sluggermuseum.com. 
And please also, our friends at the French Lick Resort, folks, you want to talk about a fantastic place to stay and play golf. Getting cold outside now, right? What a wonderful resort they have. You can just simply relax and enjoy yourself there. If you happen to be, have the opportunity to play golf, they still have you know two fantastic golf courses, two championships, one's, one designed by Pete Ross, the other, uh, Pete Dye, I should say, the other by Donald Ross, right? The uh, Pete Dye course, course hosted the Senior PGA Championship last year. They just recently hosted the LPGA Legends Championship and the Donald Ross Design Course. I love that golf course. Site of Walter Hagen's PGA Championship victory back in 1924. They got a spa, wonderful spa right there on the property as well. And guess what? A casino as well. Boy, it doesn't get any better than that, my friends. To find out more information and to book your stay, go to FrenchLick.com. All right, now back with us on the Kyvin Foods guest line and making his sixth appearance with us is Billy Sample. Let me remind you about Billy's background. He's from Roanoke, Virginia. Played in the major leagues from 1978 to 1986 for the Rangers, Yankees, and Braves. He singled on the very first major league pitch he saw back in 1978. His best season was 1983 when he was fifth in the American League in stolen bases. He batted 274 with a 331 on on-base percentage and a 732 OPS. He was the 10th toughest to strike out that year and was third in fielding for uh, left fielders. In all, Billy played 826 games, had just under 2,800 plate appearances, had 46 home runs, 230 RBIs, and a career batting average of 272, and he stole 98 bases. Billy is also a screenplay writer and a producer in his movie Reunion 108, which is a satirical comedy with a baseball backdrop. It was released last year on DVD and is now available for download through Amazon or through the movie's IMDb page. He's written a book titled A Year in Pinstripes and Then Some about his uh, one season with the Yankees. It's available on Amazon.com and is a five-star rated book. And he's now doing stand-up comedy and hopefully coming to a comedy club near you very soon. And we're excited that Billy is back with us again tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Billy, Chris and Bob, thanks for coming back on the show. Billy. Chris, thanks for the uh, – hi, Bob. Thanks for the lead-in. That was really nice. Uh, I, I'm done now. I don't have to say a word. You've already – You've already pepped me out as best as uh, I could ever do myself, but thank you very much. And, and by the way, Absolutely. if they had re-signed Jimmy Graham, maybe they wouldn't be under 500. I'm just saying. Just saying. Good point. There you go. There you go. So if if, if so, the Pan- Panthers had re-signed their their cornerback that's now in Washington, maybe they wouldn't be under 500 right now. Just saying. Just throwing that's it out exactly there. Exactly right. So, Billy, I wanted to start off our time with you tonight. You know, we, you know we've always thought you're hilarious, and the stories you tell are wonderful. But I, wh- what got you doing stand-up comedy? I was most versatile in my senior year in high school, and I keep trying to validate my classmates' uh, decision to elect me as that. So I, I'm trying to just, just to see how far <laughs> I can go in different things. But uh, it's one of those things that was on the bucket list, Chris, and I just – decided I wanted to do it uh you're probably way too innocent for my comedy and I've got to uh, I've got to take a little of the R out of it in order to, <laughs> to get regular jobs around here but I I like it I thought I was good and the owner of the place that I I had my first uh, open mic stand up uh, he really enjoyed it he was near effusive and saying nice things about it so we'll see where it goes so I can write my Billy. own material <laughs> <laughs> Billy what's harder Writing a book, being a Yankee and losing nine to two and fourteen to five to the Red Sox on the opening couple of games of the season in nineteen eighty five, or doing stand up comedy. Losing to the Red Sox, uh, we got yeah. swept. <laughs> we got swept <laughs> opening the season, and then the drum beat to fire Yogi started, I believe, with that. And it was also tough on Ed Whitson. Ed took one of the losses in that game. But sometimes when you play the Red Sox. When they have their hitting shoes on, you're just going to have to take your whippings and hope that by the time August rolls around, that they're not swinging the bats quite as well. And that was the case. When August came around and we had a four-game series with them at Yankee Stadium, we swept them. But uh, the uh, the start had already begun with the opening game uh, in Boston. And Ricky Henderson wasn't um, – he was um, – on the team, but he had injured, I think, his ankle before that series uh, leading off the season. So that hurt a little bit, too, but uh, it just started that one. And I never really understood the Boston-New York rivalry because I played most of my career in Texas, but I understood it after that, that these games mean a little more. I knew that the President's game or whatever they called it between the Mets and the Yankees was important, but I didn't realize the rivalry with the Yankees and the Red Sox. I guess growing up, 
the Red Sox really weren't that good until the mid to late 70s in 67 when they went to the World Series against the Cardinals. And, and Billy, let's talk a little bit about that 1985 season. And, and you split some time in center field with uh, Omar Moreno, who joined joined us uh, a few weeks ago. So I was curious, wh- what do you remember about Omar as a teammate? And did you ever, did you guys ever sit down and discuss the art of base dealing? No, that would have made too much sense. Um, <laughs> actually, I, I followed Omar to <laughs> to Atlanta. I, Ken Griffey Sr. was in New York when I was there. Omar in New York when I was there. We both went to Atlanta the next year, so I had an opportunity. I, actually, uh, Omar and, and our families did a lot uh, away from the ballpark, but we never really talked about base running. I believe the only guy that I really seriously talked base running to as a teammate was Wayne Tolleson. And one year, the year you mentioned in 1983, I stole 44 out of 52, and Wayne stole 33 bases, and we were sort of the tandem. So we would break it down, try to pick up pitchers' moves and things of that nature. And I also had a conversation with George Case, the late George Case, who was a tremendous base stealer with the Washington Senators back in the 40s. And I was having a little trouble with my first step, and I was trying to reach too far with my first step, and he watched me. He couldn't have seen me more than 10 minutes and told me what I was doing wrong, and then I, I just picked it up again. And I, I, I'm so appreciative of George, uh, to one, being as talented as, as he was, but two, also being able to uh, coach and teach and do it in such an efficient amount of time. Bob, question By the way, you mentioned, well, excuse me, you mentioned Willie Stargell. And I was, uh, yes. when I was in Atlanta in 86 as a – uh, as a player, and I was in Atlanta in 88, 89 as a broadcaster, Willie Starge was a first-base coach. Chuck Tanner brought all of his coaches with him, Al Monchak and Tony Bartiromo and, and Bruce Del Canton and, and others, Bob Skinner. And Willie was the first-base coach, and my goodness, down-to-earth class. That's the way I characterize Willie. What a tremendous man. And uh, I, I feel fortunate just to have been in his presence. That's just how uh, impressed I was. And I'm not easily awed by a lot, but I was, uh, I think, uh, along with a lot of people, awed by Willie. Oh, I appreciate you sharing that, Billy. Yeah, he was my, he was my idol growing up, my baseball idol growing up. I loved that guy. Yeah, he, Bob, he was something for Billy? else. Happy holidays, Billy. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. And I was looking at, at back at your rookie year, Billy, and, uh, you know, coming into the major leagues and uh, some of the teammates, especially outfielders you played with, Billy, Al Oliver, who we've talked to on the show, Benitez Bonds, I think Richie Zisk was on that team. I was just wondering <laughs> if any of those guys, Billy, uh, became uh, closer than anyone else to you and somebody that might have taken you under their wing. Well, I think Zisk was the kind of person that took it upon himself to be an instructor, to be a teacher. I I characterized him in the book as being avuncular, and and I think he tried to impart his knowledge on people, the young people, and I appreciated that. But I tell you, the the guy who I was most impressed with that treated us so well and was there as whatever we needed to be was Fergie Jenkins. Uh, It seemed as though I had a better relationship or a closer relationship sometimes with the pitchers, and that made sense at times, too. I also had a good rapport with Doyle Alexander uh, when I was with Atlanta because we would sit down and break down, what are you looking for here, what are you going to throw here? And Doyle one time took me through an at-bat. I think it was against John Tudor, yes. He said, if he misses here, he's going to do this. If he hits here, he's going to do that. And I was like, it was like the light bulb went off. I'm like, oh, my goodness, because I could think, well, I tried not to because I wasn't that smart. But I could think maybe a pitch or two ahead. I couldn't take you through the hole at bat. And I, I wish that Doyle had – we were teammates in Texas my first year. I wish Doyle and I had had that conversation then. But he, he probably figured out he was going to face me at some point in life, so he didn't want to give it all away. <laughs> and he's true. I did face him when he was with him. But s- some of those guys, and they treated us so well, the veteran players. You know, we had a lot of young players coming up at that time, Bob. We had Danny Darwin, uh, LaRue Washington, Gary Gray, Pat Putnam, um, Dave Rasich, and they just treated us so well, I, 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 especially Fergie. And I, I, I tell people that, and I, I tell people to tell Fergie that I still appreciate the way Sparky Lau, when he was traded from the Yankees to the Rangers, treated the young people so well and just a great teammate and something I'll always remember. And Billy, tonight I'm talking to you from uh, New England, where there's sub-zero wind chills, and 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 to talk I'm about. I'm close the to Texas, you, Bob. I'm close to you. 
Hey, you know. <laughs> and, and we're talking about Texas and, and Arlington and how hot it used to get. Of course, you used to play a lot of night games, Billy, but then it was still 100 first pitch. I was just wondering, I mean, do you think, I mean, you played seven years there. Was there guys that had just, that played there a while that just got so burnt out from the heat? Did it shorten careers? And do you remember a, a certain situation where it was just unbearable? Well, I think uh, the time that I felt a little um, appreciation from other players was when I was traded to the Yankees and we were playing in Arlington and we started a game at, uh, in those days, 735, and the temperature went up. And I think they kind of looked at me and, and thought, oh, okay, you've been playing in this all the time. Yeah, you're right. Uh, one year I think we had, Bob, I think we had over 43 consecutive days of over 100. And it doesn't get all that cool at night. It might get down to high 80. So uh, there's not a lot of escape from the heat. I think it's a little easier now because in the new stadium and even in the newer stadium that they're building, that there's enough infrastructure there that you can do a lot of your work inside, underneath, away from the heat. But back in the day in the old minor league park, let's say I wanted to go out and work on bunting for a base hit. Once I went out at four whatever or three whatever, I was pretty much out there the whole time. So there was a conscious decision at times that I would have to make whether or not I was going to work on things or try to conserve energy. And I think that was the tough part about that. But because of the new stadiums, I think it's a little easier to play there now. But back in the old days, not only was it hot, and you would kind of drag a little bit in August and September, but the ball, especially for left-handed pull hitters or right-handed hitters that would go to the opposite field, would not carry. It would just sort of parachute. You'd just hit your best drive, and it would just stay in the air. It wouldn't sink. Just stay in the air, and, and speedy outfielders would run it down. I don't, I don't know if you guys were talking anything uh, tonight about – I'm sure the rest of the country's talking about it. I imagine in Atlanta uh, more than anywhere else about Craig Sager. And um, yeah, he, just he, he's the kind of guy that I think just transcended whatever sport he was covering. And, I, I'm, sure, and I'm sure it was more than those colorful suits, but uh, he just seemed to be the guy. He was there with Hank's uh, 715, and, and I think that kind of started his career. And, and he was just that fixture that uh, you can understand how many people – miss him and we were talking earlier about Willie Stargell Chris and I for me I was more excited about meeting the broadcasters uh the late Frank Lieber who did a lot of Cleveland Browns games and lived in Dallas I was excited to meet him I was excited to meet Jack Buck I was excited to meet um Oh, Vin Scully, everybody, it's just my goodness, you can't say enough nice things about Vin, and Vin is just, oh my goodness, another guy that you just felt good about being around. And uh, and I think Sager in a different way was that for a lot of people, especially in basketball. And that makes a, it brings up a good point, Billy. You know, I, mean, I thought you were fantastic as a broadcaster. Why don't we see you broadcasting games anymore? Oh, that's so sweet of you to say. Uh, I took mediocrity as about as far as I could take it. They discovered it. <laughs> I, uh, I just, I, I, the last time I worked was 2008 at MLB.com, and I was versatile enough to do a lot of things, but I probably wasn't good enough to stay around for the network. And it had it had been long enough, I think. I was I was about ready to retire and uh, and move on to something else. But I, I, that's really nice of you to say because when people like you say that. Or the scouts would say that. That was my biggest compliment because you can't BS the scouts. They know the game. That's all they do is watch the game. So when they would come up to me and say something um, positive or, or say something in appreciation, that I was uh, overly flattered because those were the people that I. Because sometimes I'll watch a game in any sport that I know, but especially baseball because I played it. I'll watch a game and I, I'm thinking to myself, wow. 98% of the people don't know that I was total BS, <laughs> except me <laughs> and a couple of other people, and they get away with it. <laughs> so, but a scout would know that was, yeah, that, that's not right. That's not right. But I'll I'll just sit at home and bite my tongue or maybe scream at the TV every once in a while. So that's not true. But um, <laughs> So, again, when I get <laughs> – but I, I had some limitations as a broadcaster, and, but I, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I think I did the best I could do with what I had. I wasn't trained in it, but I think I I became a competent enough broadcaster that I would I try to whatever I do, Chris. I try to enhance 
people's appreciation of the game, whether it's broadcasting it or writing it or, or whatever I'm doing, um, even writing a, a screenplay. I'm trying to enhance people's appreciation of the game and maybe show them something or direct them in some area in which they hadn't been exposed. And if I can do that and feel good about that, then I think I've done whatever I I could do in the 20 years or so that I've been broadcasting or writing. I guess uh, longer than that now, 30 years or so that I've been broadcasting and writing. So, Billy, one more before we let you go. But you know, you've 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 done a, a baseball movie. You've written baseball books. You've been a broadcaster doing baseball. Now, stand-up comedy is 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 comedy your focus now, or what's next for you? I sit at home late at night, and I have a notepad beside me and. Whenever I'm dreaming I, and, and something wakes me up, I write it down. <laughs> and uh, it's a little different than than when I was writing for the movie or writing for the book because I could have notes accumulated for decades or so, which I actually had. But for the timeliness of doing stand-up, as I understand it, I'm going to need to be a little more immediate. So I, anytime I think of something now, I'm writing it down and then trying to figure out, well, how do I deliver this? And then I write notes down. I'm not so good to, to practice it all the way through, but I'm good if I have notes. And then I work on the, the second tier. Okay, eye contact, how do I want to interact? Uh, what kind of material do I have? I have a lot of ideology for a guy that's done only one, right? <laughs> yeah, let me tell you how to do that, uh, <laughs> Cat Williams. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, but I have actually internalized it quite a bit, so uh, we'll see where it goes. But I thought the first one went really well, so I'm I'm looking forward to doing some more. That's great, Billy. Um, is there a way that our listeners can find, you know, where you might be next or how can they follow you, you know, either online or over social media to keep up with all the things you're doing? Well, you can uh, go to my Facebook. I guess that's probably where I am. But actually, I have a, I have all kinds of Twitter, and, and I just don't remember my passwords. But I have all kinds of social media. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on everything, but I just can't remember. But I'm going to get better. I have to get better. My goodness, the kids are out of the house, so I have to do this on my own. And um, But I, I would say right now, Facebook, I usually put up everything that I'm doing on Facebook. And, and, uh, and sometimes the movies, Facebook, Reunion 108, you can get the book and the movie from that website as well, or Facebook site as well. Billy, and it's and almost, my Facebook it's page, always... I'm, I'm, wearing, I'm wearing a cap with an alpaca on it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Billy, because always alpaca so much fun to have you as part of the show, of the... my friend. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Chris. You're trying to sign off. I'm trying to talk. Uh, yeah, I've got an <laughs> alpaca on, it, on, my, on my cap because the nickname of the team in the movie That's right. is the alpacas. Yeah, we spell it with a K because K is baseball centric. The the C uh, uh, instead of the C the K. Yeah, I'll pack it, yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank Billy, you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to you and and your family. Always a great time having you as part of the show. We look forward to hopefully catching up with you again real soon, my friend. We'll talk. Uh, soon. Thank you again, Chris. All right, Bob. Yeah, Happy Holidays, you guys. I really appreciate Take, it. Thank you. Anytime. Take care, Billy. That is uh, former Rangers, Yankees, and Braves outfielder Billy Sample. And uh, you know, a great book, A Year in Pinstripes, and then some. His book uh, about the year that he spent uh, with the Yankees. And, and uh, boy, I'd, le- I'd love to see a stand-up routine, Bob. I'm sure it's hilarious. And, Chris, I tell you, in all seriousness, uh, and my father would attest, God rest his soul, Billy Sample, and I've always said this, was one of the best color commentators I've ever come yes. across uh, of guys that played the game. Uh, you would never think. I mean, he was so eloquent, so involved in those TBS broadcasts. There was less to watch in those days, Chris, so I was watching TBS a lot more. Nesson wasn't around. I was watching Billy right. Sample and those guys on TBS do their thing, and uh, Billy was one of the more polished guys. You would have thought he would have trained in it. He just knew the game, and not just knew the game, but it was an accomplished broadcaster at the time. That was 30 years ago, and, and it, just amazing to me that uh, he's going on to do what he can, but uh, don't let him fool you. He's a stand-up comic, but he was a tremendous broadcaster. Yeah, I know, and I can't believe that that's not something he, he continues to do, and people aren't, you know, he's not sought after. Because I thought he was fantastic. I agree with you. Yeah. All right, folks, we've got our next guest, Tony Collins, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Tony in our five-star picks of the week on the other side of the station identification. This is Christine Lisi, and you're listening to Thursday Night Tailgate 
where NFL stars go to tell their stories with Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazeri on the Armed Forces Radio Network. And now back with us on the Kyvin Foods guest line in his regular weekly time slot is former Patriots Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins to go through our five-star picks of the week. Hey, Tony, how are you tonight, my friend? Hey, Tony. I'm doing fantastic. How you doing, Bob and Chris? Good. Oh, Good. Really well. Thank you, Tony. So, uh, Tony, last week you and I, we uh, we struggled a bit to a 2-3 uh, a and three record while Bob uh, finished 3-2 and two and uh, – so, you know, when you look around, boy, uh, we, you got some work to do. Bob is uh, is surging, which Bob always does. So, overall, uh, Bob and I are now tied at 31-19-1. You're two games back at 29-20-1. So, you got a little ground to make up, my friend. Wow, man. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. <laughs> He's not yeah, well, let's, you know. let's put it this way. Tony Collins, I see him smoking cigars. I see him with beautiful grandchildren. He's not struggling, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> guy's really got not. the life. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I so, can't complain, Bob. I'm you, I can't complain at all, man. <laughs> yeah, when you look back to last week, fellas, you know, and, and, and the games that we struggled with, right, we all got sucked in again by the Arizona Cardinals. And, Tony, last week you said you'd never pick – the Giants again, Bob. I think you and I need to resolve that we'll never pick the Cardinals oh. again. You know, fool us oh. once, shame on us. Fool us eight times. You know, I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what that says about us because they have absolutely killed us this yeah. year. So we all got that game wrong. The Giants surprised all of us, and we all got that game wrong when they, when they uh, when they came back and beat the beat the Cowboys. So there's two of our collective losses, Bob. You and uh, you and Tony were uh, right about the Chiefs over the Raiders. I got that one wrong. And then, Bob, you and I uh, were both right on the Packers over the Seahawks. Tony went with Seattle on that one. And then we all got the Patriots over the Ravens. So that's a recap of, you know, how well or didn't or not so well that we did last week. And let's get into, let's get into our picks for, for this week. And, Tony, our first game is going to be the seven and six Tennessee Titans going to the ten and three AFC ten, or AFC Western leading uh, team, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs. The Chiefs are five point home favorite. The over under is forty two. So Tony, who knew the Tennessee Titans were actually good this year? Winners of three of their last four. Can they go into Kansas City and get themselves a win? Man, Tennessee's playing some really good football. Very surprised on, on, on what they're doing offensively and defensively, but, wow, going into Kansas City and, 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 you know, Kansas City's fighting for that home field advantage uh, throughout the playoffs right now uh, against uh, my Patriots, I just can't see that happening going up, going out there in KC and winning in KC. So uh, I got to go with Kansas City on this one. Uh, Got to be a good game, though, because Tennessee's going to put up a big fight against them. So, uh, I say 27-24, Kansas City. All right. Bob, what do you think? Hey, I can't argue with that. I, you got a team, uh, Tennessee, looks looks pretty good here. And Kansas City, I mean, again, we talk all the time, Chris, how tough it is to go in there and win. Mm-hmm. I think they'll get a decent test, but uh, Kansas City just seems to they, – they're, they're on a roll, and I think they're just going to continue it. And I like Tony's score. I'm going to say 30-24, Kansas City. All right. Well, guys, if you look at it, you know, the Titans have beaten the Broncos and the Packers over the last four weeks. They've gone four consecutive games without giving up a turnover, which is one shy of their franchise record. Mariota having a nice season, the seventh-rated passer in the league, 25 touchdowns, only eight interceptions. And uh, those 25 touchdowns have him tied for fifth in the league. Now you sort of add in DeMarco Murray, right, second in the league in rushing. Their defense, Tony, as you mentioned, third against the run. And you can understand why Tennessee's having a nice year. The sort of the soft underbelly for the Titans is their pass defense. They are next to last in the league. So this may be the one game that fantasy players might want to actually start Alex Smith. Now, on the opposite side, Kansas City won three in a row, eight of their last nine. They swept the season series from the Raiders, so they hold the tiebreaker there. Tyreek Hill, what a what a guy, that guy, what a player that guy is. He's on fire, scoring touchdowns receiving, scoring touchdowns rushing, scoring touchdowns on kick returns all over the last several weeks in their defense. You know, boy, you look at their defense. They give up a lot of yards. They're 27th against the run and 18th against the pass, but only eighth in points allowed. So they're sort of the bend, don't break 
defense, and they forced 25 turnovers this season, tied for most in the, in the league. So that's how you get a lot of wins, and I'm with you guys. And, Tony, I got the exact same score you have, my friend. The, I got the Chiefs in this one. I got a 27-24, too. All right, our second game this week is the surprising 9-4 and four Lions going to the 9-4 and four Giants. The Giants are a, a four-point home favorite. The over-under is 41. And, Tony, since you have vowed to never pick the Giants again, I guess the only <laughs> thing we need to know is how much will the Lions win by? <laughs> I, I might have to retract my statement. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I tell you. Uh man, it's, it's, it, this is this this game right here is, is probably one of those uh, flip the coin ones because you know I know Detroit's quarterback got a bad finger man and, and you know playing in that cold weather and in, in, in New York man with that finger like it is it's gonna be tough to throw that football. Uh, golly, I, I I gotta flip the coin on this one man. Here we go. <laughs> Heads New York. Tails, Lions. Lions, man. Oh, God, I don't want that. I'm going with the Lions. I'm going, I'm going with the Lions. Two out of three? Uh, this yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. I got to go with the Lions, man. I got to go with the coin flip. So, Lions, Lions with, a, with, a, with, a, with a close one, 20 to 17. Lions coming, up, coming in New York with an upset. I don't know if that's an upset or not, but uh, I'm going with Lions. All right, Bob, what do you think? You know, these teams are so similar, guys. Both have the same home record and road record. So you go, you got to go with the home team, I would believe. I mean, you got Detroit 3-3 three and three on the road. Tony made a good point. A quarterback with a bad thumb, uh, not good uh, on the road. Um, I guess the weather will improve for Sunday, guys. Supposed to have snow on Saturday, but Sunday should be okay and warmer. I don't think it will be a factor, but... I think the Giants pull it out. Ugly game, 2017. All right. You got 2017 the opposite way. Tony says 2017 yeah. Lions. You got 2017 Giants. All right. Well, guys, you know, the Lions, you know, they've won five in a row in eight of their last nine. And, and over their wins this year, only one has been by more than a touchdown. Five have come within a field goal or less. So you talk about a team living on the edge. Matthew Stafford having a good year. Tony, you mentioned the finger. But uh, ninth in passing yards, tenth in passer rating, and you know when. And here's a stat for you: when he's been blitzed this year, he's completing 65 percent of his passes, seven touchdowns, no interceptions. His passer rating is 106.2 when he's blitzed, which is even better than when he's not blitzed. So you talk about a guy that handles the pressure really well. Well, that's Matthew Stafford. On the opposite side, Bob, you've seen this a lot, right? Eli having a tough season, probably the worst of his career, and his defense has been bailing him out a bunch, 22nd in passer rating, and according to uh, Pro Football Focus, he has the second most plays that have either led to a turnover or should have led to a turnover, but the defender dropped the ball. And last week, one interception, but defenders dropped interceptions three more times. So it could have been a lot worse last week. So, you know, eventually defenses are going to, you know, you know going to make more of those catches, and that's what's going to kill you in, in December and January. So keep your eyes on the matchup, too, between Lions defensive end Kerry Hyder, and, uh, who's got a quarterback pressure in every single game this year, plus one sack and seven hurries over the last three weeks. He's coming on strong. He'll be going against the Giants right tackle Bobby Hart, who hasn't surrendered a sack in the last five games, so it should be a good matchup to watch. I think Stafford's got the hot hand. We'll see if the, the finger makes it, you know, it makes a difference or not, Tony. But uh, you know, the Giants don't want to talk about anything having to do with hot hands, JPP. So I'm going to take the Lions, and I think they win that game, 27 to 24, a close one as well. We've got our next guest, Lito Shepard, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Lito in just a moment here. We got two more games to kind of get through. Our third game this week is uh, my eight and five Steelers going to the five seven and one Bengals, and the Steelers are a three and a half point road favorite. The over under here is forty four. Tony, can my boys get a very important road division win this week? I don't see why not, man. They're, they're playing some real good football right now. Uh, offensively, uh, scoring some points. Uh, Le'Veon Bell, man, probably one of the, uh, if not the best back in, in the in the league right now. Uh, just having a tremendous season, coming out of the backfield, catching the ball, running the ball. He's just just an incredible. He, he's, he's that kind of back that everybody wants on their team. So, gotta go with Pittsburgh, man. You know, Cincinnati. I think they won the last couple of games, but you know, not not much of a 
uh, uh, big two two big wins. You know, beating beating Cleveland. I think uh, my high school team can beat Cleveland right now. So um, uh, gotta gotta go with gotta go with the Steelers winning winning this one. Uh, and, and and I think uh, well, I, I wasn't gonna give it. No, nah, I am gonna give it a blowout. Thirty-seven to seven, Pittsburgh. Oh. Wow, Tony Khan with a blowout special of the week. There you got it. The Steelers 37-7. to Bob, what do you think? I think Pittsburgh kind of puts an end to Cincinnati's season here. They they like it to happen to no one better than such a division rival. So uh, I, I, I totally agree with Tony. I mean, Cincinnati, they've given up more than they've scored. Uh, and, uh, again, I think Pittsburgh, they're just on a roll. Bell looking at, for MVP votes now. He's that good. And uh, so, yeah, Pittsburgh goes into Cincinnati uh, in front of their own crowd and uh, puts it to them. I'm going to say 30-17 Pittsburgh. All right. So, guys, you know, my Steelers have won four in a row after losing four in a row, and I don't put much stock in their wins over the Browns or the Andrew Luckless Colts that they beat. But I do like the convincing wins over the last couple of weeks over the Giants and the Bills. And, and Tony, to your point, Le'Veon Bell, what a monster week last week uh, against the Bills in the snow. 38 carries, and it felt like it was 60 for 236 yards and three touchdowns, another four catches for 62 yards, so nearly 300 yards from scrimmage for Bell. The Bengals have missed 55 tackles on run plays this season, the third most in the league, and I hope they continue to miss even more. Over the last six games, guys, James Harrison, five sacks, two quarterback hits, 14 hurries, two of the Steelers' rookie defensive backs, and Artie Burns and Sean Davis really progressing really well in the second half, and the run defense has gotten even better without Cam Hayward in there, which is mind-boggling. So, uh, you know, kudos to Daniel McCullers and you know, Stephon Tewitt for really stepping it up in his absence. So I think they keep it going this week. I'm with you guys. I like my Steelers to win the game. I got it 30-23. to 23. Tony, our next game is uh, your boys, the 11-2 and two, uh, Patriots going to the uh, slumping 8-5 and five Broncos. The Patriots are a three-and-a-half-point road favorite. The over-under is 44. So, Tony, will your Patriots keep things rolling up there in uh, Denver this week? One thing that the Patriots are, I, and I know Belichick is, is, is talking, maybe not talking a lot about it, but I know he's focusing on this. He wants home field advantage throughout the playoffs. So, he, they're going out to Denver. They're going to play solid football. Uh, I, I was at the game last week watching watching them um, playing against the, the the Ravens, and and they totally dominated that game the first three quarters. You know they had those two back to back turnovers, and they, you know let the Ravens get back in the football game. But uh, you know my, my my boys playing some good football right now. The defense is playing well uh, with some sacks and a couple turnovers. So I I see them going out to Denver, which is a tough place to play. But right now, man, Denver's offense is like, uh, man, it, it, it's 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 like nothing. I I just don't see them scoring a lot of points against against the Patriots, even though they still got probably one of the best defenses in defenses in, in, in the league. But you know, we got Brady and we got Belichick, and we're gonna go out there and win twenty seven seventeen Patriots. All right, Bob, what do you got? Yeah, I like Tony's analysis there. I think New England, I mean, is going to be one of these few teams that they have pride in wanting to, to run the table, Chris, on the road. They may go 8-0 and on the road this year, which hasn't happened much when you think about it throughout the uh, history since they've gone to a 16-game schedule. So, yeah, I think they're going to go out there. Even without Gronkowski, they're outscoring most teams. And what's amazing, what goes under the radar screen, guys, is we hear so much about the Denver defense, and New England's given up less points than them. So think about that. So, yeah, I think Tony's right. They uh, home field through the playoffs, so they go there kind of coast 30 to 20. 30 to 20. All right. And, guys, like we've said several times, right, never bet against Tom Brady unless it's in the Super Bowl against the Giants. And, and last week against one of the best defenses in the league, Brady puts up 406 and three touchdowns. Patriots rookie wide receiver Malcolm Mitchell has four touchdowns in his last four games. Garrett Blunt has rushed for over 1,000 yards now, and what you may not realize is the Patriots' defense is second in points allowed per game at 17.7, and they're sixth against the run. So they're playing well on both sides of the ball. I think they go up to Denver and get themselves a win as well. I like them 27-20. to 20. All right, our last game this week is the 8 and 5 Bucks going to the 11 and 2 Cowboys and the Cowboys are a 7 point home favorite and the over under is 47. Tony, we've seen some chinks in the Cowboys armor over the last couple of weeks. Can they keep, you know, get things back together, I guess I should say, this week and uh, you know, keep the cries for Tony Romo 
you know, to a minimum as uh, hopefully they get back on track? Or is this the week that uh, the Tampa Bay really puts a stamp on their season? Tell you what, man, Tampa, Tampa Bay is playing some really good football. Their defense is 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 is, is, is scary, man. They're, they got a great pass rush. Uh, the secondary is playing good. They're, they're tackling very well. Uh, James James Winston is playing some good football right now. Um, but you know, I I, I still kind of like the Cowboys, man, with that offensive line. And uh, you know, Dak Dak didn't have a real good game last week, and you know, made a couple. Through a couple of interceptions, maybe, but uh, man, I, I just can't see Tampa Bay going into Dallas and beating them right now because you know Dallas is also fighting for that home field advantage throughout the playoffs, and that's something that I think they they really would want. Uh, I, I I gotta go with Dallas, but it's gonna be a close game, closer than a lot of people think it's gonna be. Uh, twenty-seven to twenty-six, Dallas wins by one. Wow! All right, Bob, what do you got? I like Dallas in a close game, too, guys. You know, coming off that loss, I think they get it back together, uh, especially at home. Uh, like Tony said, home field means a lot. Uh, after, you know, maybe one more win, then they can kind of maybe start coasting. But, yeah, they go home. They right the ship. All the other talk is, is put to rest. And uh, they'll take Tampa Bay out about 35-21. All right. Well, guys, I like the Bucks. You know, they've won five in a row in the middle of that stretch. They beat the Chiefs. They beat Seattle and uh, allowed a total of 22 points in those two games. So defense playing really well, to your point, Tony. And speaking of 22 points, that's also the total points the Cowboys have scored the last two weeks. Dak Prescott hasn't thrown for multiple touchdowns now for three games. And, and last week he threw two interceptions in a game for the first time. His passer rating was only 45.4, so by far his worst game of the season. Now they're playing at home, which is sort of the good news, bad news, right? The good news is he's back in you know, you know familiar surroundings. The bad news is so if he gets off to a rough start, you got to wonder if some of the boo birds and chance for Tony Romo could start raining down on him unfairly. I might add, but you know how you know we, we get down on quarterbacks pretty quickly as fans. So Cowboys defense is ranked 28th against the pass, meaning Jameis Winston and Mike Evans could have big days. I'm telling you guys, I like it. I like Tampa Bay. I like what they're doing. I like them to get an upset win, 24 to 20. Tony, before we let you go, remind everyone about the great things you're doing to help kids go to college. Tony College Doc. Uh, TonyCollinsFoundation.com and TonyCollinsProjects.com. Go to the website. We're giving out scholarships for high school uh, seniors to go off to college, man, doing some great work with the kids, and it's great mentoring with them as well. So go to the website and make a donation. There you go. Tony, doing great stuff. Thanks for coming back on the show this week. Always a great time with you. We look forward to catching up with you again next week. Have a great week. Absolutely. You too. Take care. Take care, Tony. Take care, Tony. That is uh, former Patriots Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins with our five-star picks of the week. We've got our next guest, Lito Shepard, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Lito on the other side of this station identification. This is Reggie Kelly, former Cincinnati Bengals and Atlanta Falcons tight end. And you're listening to TNT, Thursday Night Tailgate. Brace yourself for the explosion. Now making his debut with us on the Kyvin Foods guest line is former Eagles Pro Bowl defensive back Lito Shepard. Let me give you some background on Lito. He's from Jacksonville, Florida. In high school, he had 18 interceptions in 29 games, and he helped the Reigns Vikings to an undefeated season in the state championship in 1998. Played his college ball at the University of Florida, playing for Steve Spurrier from 1999 to 2001. He was a first-team All-American in 2000 and a first-team All-SEC selection in 2000 and 2001. In 2006, the Gainesville Sun named him one of the, one of the 100 greatest Gators of all time. He was a first-round draft pick, the number 26 selection overall by the Philadelphia Eagles in 2002. He played in the league from 2002 to 2011 for the Eagles, Jets, Vikings, and Raiders. Was a two-time Pro Bowl selection in 2004 and 2006. And over the course of his career, he had 345 tackles, 19 interceptions, three of which he returned for touchdowns. And two of those touchdowns were from over 100 yards, making him the first player in NFL history to have two 100-plus yard interception returns. He also forced three fumbles and had three sacks, and we're very excited that he is with us tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Lito, Chris, and Bob here. Thank you for joining us. 
Thanks, Lito. Man, I, I, hey, I appreciate you guys having me. And I tell you, man, that introduction was one of the best I've ever had. So <laughs> congratulations <laughs> on that. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks for having me, definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Lito. And, and Lito, I wanted to, you know, yeah. you know, start our time with you tonight by going back to your time at the University of Florida. And, you know, a guy who had so much success in high school, I have to believe. Yeah. There were tons of schools lining up, knocking on your door, trying to get your services. So who else was in the mix besides Florida, and how did Florida end up winning out? Well, you know, uh, just modestly speaking, but I, I was uh, the number one uh, DB in the nation uh, by USA Today Parade All-American team. And um, I, I really had the choice to go everywhere, anywhere in the country that, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to play for. So uh, just just being a homegrown Jacksonville native, um, I, I really didn't want to leave far to go to school, you know, from home. So I really gave the state of Florida the first dibs as far as, you know, top colleges that I, you know, wanted to attend. Now, outside of that, I also wanted to, you know, not shorten myself and give the, the schools that, that produce predominant are some predominant DBs throughout the years that, you know, they, they, they had a pretty good staff. So I gave Ohio State a chance and I gave uh, Georgia a chance outside the state of Florida. But I definitely wanted to give Florida, Florida State and Miami, you know, the big three at the time I was coming out, uh, first dibs. And it, it's funny how that process kind of played out because – Although I gave the three Florida states first dibs, I only went on a visit to one of them. <laughs> Is that right? And just, yeah, and, and, and that was to Florida. And um, you know, it, it's funny how that played out. But Ohio State was a, was a great uh, institute that had a, a rich tradition, and just being so far away, you know, I, I really wanted my family to have a chance to see me play. And that's what really played into that factor. And, and Georgia was neck and neck with Florida for me. And it just so happened that, you know, Florida was a lot closer. And that's why I chose Florida. <laughs> and, and Lita, when you look back at your time at Florida, is there a game that you reflect back on and say, boy, that was a great win? And is there, a, on the opposite side, is there a loss that still bothers you? Well, I, I, I'll start with the loss. Um, it, it, it is one loss that really sticks out more than any loss I've taken at Florida, and it wasn't very many, by by the way. But um, right. it was the uh, 2011 uh, year, and uh, the 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 reason I remember it because of the 9/11 you know incident that happened that year, and the games got postponed that week of college football. Uh, if anybody can remember that time. Uh, yeah. So we were we were set to play the Tennessee Volunteers. Uh, you know, the Gators we were rolling at that time, felt real confident and we were strong at that time too. So that game got postponed and we ran the table um prior to them to, well, we they scheduled the Tennessee game after being postponed to the end of the season, right after the Florida State game. And we ran the table and Tennessee had all the incentives at that time and came in the, to the swamp that year and beat us by two points. And I, I really felt like that was our national championship team. And if we would have got past the balls on that, on that year, we would have been playing for a national championship, but you know, that game definitely sticks out and, and it, it hurts the most, <laughs> you know, from that standpoint. And, um, but I will say on the opposite end of that, other than, you know, playing in, Jacksonville against the Bulldogs and having you know pretty good success. The one of my better games came in Tennessee where we had a, a very close game. I think it was the year before that, and we had a controversial game-winning touchdown catch by Jabbar Gaffney that propelled us uh, to that victory in Tennessee. But uh, those those are some of the most memorable ones that I can remember, and it's just uh, unfortunate and fortunate that Tennessee is on, on the end of both of those. <laughs> <laughs> And Lito, when you yeah. look back at the, you know, at the, at your tenure at Florida, you the first two years you played Florida State, they beat you. Your last year there, you beat Florida State. You know how? Yep. A, a, you know how, how important was it for you to get a win over Florida State while while you were a Gator? And B, if you when you lose, do you hear about it all year? Yeah, well, you know, and and that's one of the things. Florida State has always had pretty tough teams, and 
you know, uh, one of our tougher rivals, rivalries, you know, throughout the history. And my freshman year, uh, playing against those guys, it was a, a, a huge experience. I mean, you know, just seeing the level of talent and the type of players that they had at that time, you know, it was it was quite an experience. And I didn't play a lot that game, so although I went two and I wanted to against um, Florida State, I really say I went one and one because <laughs> you know it's just <laughs> as a starter. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, it, it it always feels good to to get a victory on your belt against those guys because you know you you play against some of those guys throughout your high school career, and even you meet a lot of them afterwards at, at the next level if you're fortunate enough to make it. And um, you know, you just it's a it's a it's a great respect, but it's even better when you when you got a victory on your belt. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Bob, yeah. questions for Lito. Happy holidays, Lito, and thanks for coming on the show. And uh, I, I was looking at your high school career, Lito, and I just couldn't get over. Mm-hmm. And it shouldn't surprise me <laughs> the uh, the alumni that come out of these schools in Florida. So many, over twenty players from Reigns High School went to the pros, yes. including guys like Brian Dawkins, yourself, and Harold Carmichael mm-hmm. and Burrow. Guys, I grew up watching with. Is there a very strong alumni network still down there, Lito? Do you keep in touch with a lot of these guys? Well, you know, I I, I do think um, we have a strong network. Um, A lot of guys are scattered around still to this day, but I think with the the history and the tradition of, in particular, our school, Reigns High School, we 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 keep in touch like throughout the year it's crazy how it happens because to some nature you know guys always come back throughout the football year to to watch a one or two games and um last year the nfl did a a great job of of bringing some of us guys back together with the uh, 50th anniversary doing the um super bowl um uh, ordeal where they gave our represented us presented us a, a golden football to um, high schools where they had players to go on to represent their teams on, on Super Bowls. So we had about four or five guys that represented Reigns that played in Super Bowls uh, throughout their career. So that that was big. But you know, it, it is a privilege uh, to be a, one of very many to come out of our area and to make it to that next level. So um, I don't know if it's something in the water or, you know, just a uh, great, great tr- tradition. <laughs> yeah. Lito, yeah. the 2002 draft was was incredibly impressive as far as defensive players. There were six DBs, mm-hmm. I believe, that went in that first round, including yourself, and, and mm-hmm. guys that come to mind like Julius Peppers and Freeney, and I can go on and on. It was incredible. Uh, when you're mm-hmm. drafted number 26, just wanted to get your thoughts on that draft day. Mm-hmm. Were you pleasantly surprised? Was there any disappointment in uh, the, the reaction when you heard that Philadelphia had selected you? Right. You know, it, it, it's, it's, that's, that was one of the most nerve-wracking days I've ever experienced. Um, you know, it, it was a lot of great things going on. And I, the, the things that I remember, the draft was very long. I will say that, um, you know, we probably started that day about eight, nine o'clock in the morning and I didn't get drafted even though I went in the first round 26 pick until about five, six o'clock that evening, (laughs) you know? So, um, honestly, I felt like I was one of the top three DBs in college football at that time. And I didn't know how that was going to play out or translate, you know, when the draft started, but talent-wise, I, I was fully confident in what I was able to bring to the table. But when the uh, Eagles drafted me, that was a big surprise because I, I didn't have any contact with the Eagles throughout that process. And it's crazy. The uh, 49ers had the uh, 27th or yeah, 27th or 28th pick right behind Philly, and they were down to work me out like two days before the draft. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they worked this out for like three hours out there. And I was pretty confident that I, I had a good showing. So other than um, a couple teams that I spoke with in the top 20, you know, area, when they went other ways, I was still 
confident or hopeful that the 49ers had interest. But the Eagles came out of nowhere and got me the pick before, and I and I was blessed to uh, be a part of such a, a, a tremendous, great, awesome, you know, franchise. So that it was a surprise, though. <laughs> And Lito, being from Jacksonville, sort of, you know, at, and at the time, right, you know, the, the Jags uh, were a very young franchise. Yet, you know, when you were growing mm-hmm. up, who was who was the who was the team mm-hmm. you followed? Who was your favorite team? You know, I tell you what, I, I do have a couple of favorite players that I've always admired and definitely helped me um, prolong my football career early on, and. It's, I, I got a mixture, but my favorite player growing up was Barry Sanders, hands down. And, you know, although we have one of the all-time greatest, if not arguably the greatest, arguably the greatest running back from University of Florida, Emmitt Smith, but Barry Sanders is my all-time favorite running back. And it was just how elusive he was and just his ability to break tackles and, and, and do some things that nobody ever thought he could with his size. Um, but my favorite team was the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, and it was right after the Montana era when kind of Steve Young started taking over. And I remember Ricky Waters and uh, Jerry Rice and all those guys, Brent Jones, uh, Charles Hagley before he went to Dallas, you know, even the year Dion was in the 49ers uniform. And, and those guys just really made an imprint on me as far as growing up. And um, uh, I, I had to switch teams when I think it was 1994 or 5, somewhere up in there when the Jaguars re- revisited that area and got the Jaguars. So, you know, just being from Jacksonville, I always rooted for them. Yep. And, Lito, when you look back over the course of your career with the Eagles, boy, you tortured the Dallas Cowboys over the course of your career. Eight mm. of your 19 interceptions – came against Dallas. You had two pick sixes against them that you returned for over 100 yards. What was it about the Cowboys that brought out the best in you? You know, uh, not only that they were a rival in our division and we played them twice a week. Um, you know, I always try to tell some of the younger players nowadays that, you know, watching film is, is big when it comes to making that next step into uh, your career. And I really picked up a lot of things that Dallas liked to do and that they tried to attack us with that they didn't change. And just over the course of years, uh, some of those things I was able to remember and in key opportunity times and games, they presented themselves. And I can always remember, um, and I'm giving away one of my secrets here, but uh, Dallas was the only (laughs) team that, did a sprint out pass on third and three or shorter yardage in games. So I saw that and through like, um, I probably saw it three times in like eight games of watching film and it came in the same situation, you know, third and short, third and short and Romo or whoever the quarterback was, was always under the center. And it's just something that stuck with me. So, you know, they did a lot of things that, they didn't change, and you had to be able to pick up if you was a, a, a student of the game like that. Yep. Bob, one more for Lito before we let him go? Yeah, sure, Lito. I want to ask you, uh, you had that, it's a very successful career in Philly, but I want to ask you about the one year in New York. Cause I know I saw you play at the Meadowlands that year with the mm. playoff team, Rex Ryan and mm-hmm. uh, guys like Kerry Rhodes and Revis when he was Revis. Just wanted to get mm-hmm. your uh, – memories of that 09 team and what it was like up here in the Meadowlands? You know, I, that that was a bittersweet year for me. Um, it was a, a year I was, um, I was re, well, actually coming off a trade year, you know, just had some things going in Philly to uh, where kind of, um, I was in a slump in career wise and, and getting traded to New York was a, a, a big, fresh breath of relief. And, I remember starting off that year at a high playing pace. Um, The first three games, I was probably the best DB on the field, you know, although, you know, we had Revis Island and all. As far as stats, though, you know, I was out there making plays and on on a Pro Bowl path that year. And I can never forget it. Uh, We played the New England Patriots. Um, Joey Galloway and uh, Tom Brady was there at the time. 
And I, I pulled my quad, like, in the second quarter of that game, making a great play, uh, breaking up a pass in the end zone. And that really set me back as far as uh, adding to the team and just the production that they needed to get over that hump. But in all, you know, that, that, that was a great experience. Um, I had injuries that kind of threw off the chemistry to take us to that next level. And even with all that said, we were able to make it to the um, – championship game where we um, lost against Peyton Manning and the Colts uh, that year. but uh, and, and also we had a rookie quarterback in Mark Sanchez, which he, he did. I think that was probably his best year of his career. But, you know, uh, just one of those things to where if, if I would have stayed healthy, I think um, it could have panned out to be a, 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 a bigger, better, greater deal, so to say. Yep. Lito, I, I read one of your children is named Boston, and I hope that's because you're a Red Sox fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, that, that's that's not the case. But um, I, I will say this. I have became, uh, I wouldn't say a, a fan, but I have gained a great respect for the New England Patriots and uh, Tom Brady. So, although they had no influence on my uh, naming of my son, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I do have a great respect for those guys because Tom Brady and the uh, Patriots were the only team to ever uh, rob me of that uh, Super Bowl victory. So, yeah. <laughs> so, Lita, what are you doing now? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Um, I'm actually in that transition mode uh, four and a half years later, but um, I'm actually three-quarters away to being um, – a, a licensed realtor in here in the state of Florida, and I'm very excited about that uh, and, and uh, progressing in that area. But also I've been um, steady progressing in the path of trying to get back to coaching of some sort. Um, I, I really feel like I have a, a gift, a passion, and a lot of knowledge, nonetheless, that I could pass on to uh, guys who, who, you know, who, who can use that help and, I know the NFL very well. Um, I've had a lot of success in it, and I, I, I think that I would be a great addition if anybody gave me a chance in that area. But like I say, you know, that's a, that's that's something that I'm working on down the line. But I, I definitely don't count coaching out in the near future. Also, good for you. Mm-hmm. So, Lito, how can our listeners, you know, follow you whether it's online or over social media? Well, well, I have a, a, a couple of different things going. Um, you know, uh, social media, I'm, I'm on uh, Facebook, I'm on uh, Instagram, I'm actually on uh, FireFan. It's a new app that just uh, launched that, you know, give fans a chance to compete against myself and other uh, former uh, professional athletes in different uh, venues. And, um, I mean, you know, the more you guys have me on the show, uh, I can definitely keep sharing, you know, things that are coming up in my life and that I could definitely get my fans and, and, and you know, your listeners involved with. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just really, uh, you know, taking it day by day here. <laughs> we could definitely well, get them on Lito, the TV you. site up here, Chris. Definitely. We'll definitely Absolutely. do Absolutely. And, Lito, yeah, we'd love yeah. to have you come back on the show again and share – more of your stories. Bob and I got tons of other questions we'd love to, to get through with you. We hope yeah. you'll come back and, and join us again real soon. I will. I, I know I, I can uh, talk a lot here. So, but, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, I've been away from the game a little while, so it, it is really refreshing to, you know, get a chance to talk about football and just being that, that, that mixture again. So I definitely appreciate you guys for having me here. Thank you. Thank Lito. you very much, Lito. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to uh, to you and your family. Like I say, we hope you'll come back and join us again real soon. Definitely. Appreciate it, you guys. Good night, Lito. All right. Take care, Lito. That is uh, former Eagles Pro Bowl defensive back Lito Shepard. A lot of good stuff in there, Bob. Boy, you know, and I, I would have never guessed that Tennessee was on the plus and the minus side for him, uh, you know, when you go back over his uh, college career, that, that that would be the team that, you know, he would say, you know, worst loss and, and, and best win. I would have guessed, some, you know, a couple of others, but so many other things. Two two interceptions, Bob, over 100 yards returned against the yeah. Cowboys. What an amazing player he was. 
And that's uh, where he really, really uh, made his name, Chris. When you mentioned Lito Shepard's name, anyone in the uh, NFC East, uh, there's a lot of fans up here remember that that accomplishment. And uh, but they forget what kind of very good, solid ten-year career he had. And uh, when he talked about getting into real estate, Chris, and I said to myself, "My goodness, this guy probably should be coaching somewhere. He's got that kind of right. incredible background, high school, college, and uh, I'm sure he'll." He'll surface somewhere, and uh, I, I think uh, somebody could definitely use a guy of his talents as far as a coach. And we'll do all we can, Chris, to publicize that. There you go. Exactly right. All right, we've got our next guest, Musa Muhammad, hanging on the line. And before we get to Moose, I want to give a shout-out to our friends over at Podbean who have been so very good to us, featuring Thursday night tailgate in our golf show next on the tee, whether it's online at, uh, at podbean.com or on their mobile app as well. So if you're listening to this show as a podcast, we hope you're doing it via Podbean. It's uh, a wonderful uh, it's a wonderful application. Boy, you can get instant updates every time uh, we publish a, uh, a new episode. Their app and their site are free to use, and they have great features to let you easily discover, listen, and even publish your own podcast if you like. Whether you use an Android or an iPhone, Podbean is the app for your podcasting needs. Get the app now on Google Play or the Apple App Store so you can enjoy more of the podcasts that you love, and we hope two of them are Thursday Night Tailgate and next on the T. And also, please, don't forget our friends at the Gridiron Greats organization. Please help support a wonderful cause that's taking care of the guys who literally left so much of themselves out on the field. Remember, folks, these guys are the guys that, you know, played you know, way back when they still had to get off-season jobs to support themselves and their families. It's organizations like this one that was started by Mike Ditka, the Gridiron Greats, you know, who are there trying to help these guys that we all grew up watching, hearing about, reading about. Please go to gridirongreats.org to see what you can do to get involved and how you can help. All right, now back with us and making his fifth appearance on the Kaivin Food guest line is Moosin Muhammad, and let me remind you about Moose's background. He's from Lansing, Michigan, played his college ball at Michigan State, where in his senior season he was fifth in the Big Ten in both receptions and receiving yards. He was a second-round draft pick by the Carolina Panthers in 1996, and he played in the league from 96 to 2009 with the Panthers and the Bears. He was selected to the Pro Bowl twice in 1999 and again in 2004. He led the league in receptions in 2000 with 102, and he led it in receiving yards in 2004 with 1,405 yards. Over the course of his playing career, he amassed 860 receptions for 11,438 yards, and he scored 62 touchdowns. He was a part of the 2003 NFC champion Carolina Panthers, the team that nearly, nearly knocked off the Patriots in Super Bowl 38. He went back to the Super Bowl three years later with the Bears in Super Bowl 41. In 2014, he was inducted into the Gridiron Greats Hall of Fame, and we are honored that Moose is back with us again tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Moose, Chris and Bob, how you doing, my friend? Welcome Chris, back, Bob. Chris, Bob, uh, great to be back on the show. I tell you, it gives me goosebumps to, uh, to hear you talk about uh, that history like that, you know. <laughs> I'm glad it does. So, so, Moose, I wanted to start off our time by talking about the Gridiron Greats Hall of Fame. It's a great distinction. You're honored by Mike Ditka's organization. Those folks are really fantastic, an organization that means a great deal to us. We've been partnering with them for several years. You were inducted along with, uh, you know, a guy that's been on our show several times, former Lions kicker Eddie Murray, and uh, also yeah. your uh, college teammate Derek Mason. So talk about, you know, what it was like being recognized, and now you're a Hall of Famer. No, it was definitely an honor, and – um you know, it was back in Detroit, you know, uh, the, they had the ceremony back there um, and got a chance to shake the hands, meet a lot of other fellow gridiron greats and, um, you know, former um, you know, great players and, um, you know, going in with Derek Mason, who, you know, like you mentioned, played on the other side of me, uh, you know, back at Michigan State and, and, you know, back in our, really our backyard in, in Detroit and uh, where I have a lot of family. And uh, it, it was really an honor. It was an eerie feeling, um, you know, wa- walking through Ford Field and, uh, you know, being in there and accepting that a- award and, and being recognized for a very, very hard, hard fought and long career. Uh, but, uh, and, and like I said, I mean, it was, it was fun to go in with a, with an old teammate of mine. You know, we, uh <laughs> 
you know, bled a lot together. We both had long careers. I played 14 years. I think Derek played about 14 or 15 years. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, just, just beating the pavement with, uh, with Michigan state, Tony Banks was our quarterback. And, um, you know, we had a big old left tackle, uh, Flozell Adams that wound up having a long career with Dallas and, uh, just a lot of fun, but, uh, yeah, we talked about a lot, a lot of great memories and, um, they did a great job of putting that event on. It's just an honor to be a part of. And Moose, I wanted to get your thoughts on the college playoff situation as a guy who who played in the Big Ten. You know, you know, as you look at you know the the situation between Penn State and Ohio State, do you think the committee got it right with uh, with, with choosing Ohio State over Penn State, or or did Penn State get uh, get uh, jobbed a little bit? Uh, I mean, we know Penn State got the job. I mean, I think everybody knows that, but they got to expect to get the job as well. I mean, you know. Um, you know, Ohio State with only one loss. I mean, even though, uh, you know, they didn't compete and win the Big Ten title, I don't think the playoff system is really designed for, uh, you know, just a conference winner to uh, to, to represent in the playoffs. I, I just don't believe that. And I don't think it's going to be reflected that way. And I think there's no guarantees that says that just because you win your conference uh, in the conference game that you're going to have the best record that year and that you're going to be the team that, uh, should make it to the to the college playoff system. Now, I mean, we know that there's human error. We know that there's flaws in this system, and uh, you know, obviously, you know, some of those flaws are being exposed when you have so much parity and the and the records are, uh, you know, you got teams that that aren't undefeated, and um, and you've got this selection committee that's not a computer. It's people sitting around the table, and there's a lot of bias and a lot of opinions and. And let's be frankly honest, a lot of this is about selling tickets. You know, it's about uh, the team that. Uh, you know, had, that travels well. And uh, I think, um, you know, for Washington to get in, you know, they only have one loss, uh, you know, rightfully so. You know, you know they squeak in there, but uh, there's some questionable, um, you know, so I think it was questionable when they got into that fourth spot and then, they, you know, a couple of weeks before the end of the season and then obviously uh, finishing out strong allowed them to, to maintain that position. But, uh, you know, with Penn State having a couple of losses, even though they won the Big Ten, um, you know, they still they still were not they didn't have the best schedule and they opened themselves up to a lot of criticism and I think uh, you know, until they return back to the prominence as an organization, uh, they're gonna compete with, with Ohio State. I mean, you, you think about Michigan. I mean Michigan is right up there as well. You know, I think we could have easily had, you know, two or three big ten teams in the college playoffs, but um, you know, that's not the case and I think, you know, the committee for the most part I thought they did a pretty good job, you know. Um, you know, like I said, there's a lot of human error in there, and you're never going to get it 100% right, foolproof. But, um, you know, I think we'll enjoy this system. The, the first team out is always going to complain, and that's going to be that way every year. Uh, Penn State just so happens to be that. And, uh, you know, win, winning the Big Ten doesn't guarantee you're going to get in. Got to have the best record. Bob, questions for Moose? Yeah, welcome back to the show, Moose. Always a pleasure. And I, I wanted to take you back to your rookie year because that was a very, very good Carolina Panthers team. And uh, we talked earlier in the show, Moose, about coaches and coordinators, who should be doing what, who shouldn't be doing what. Capers, uh, at the time uh, and now, 20 years later, Moose still uh, having success as a coordinator. I just want to get your thoughts on him as a head coach at the time. Uh, you know, C Capers was, uh, we had a wild group of guys back then. I mean, it was a different NFL in 96 when I came in the league and mm -hmm. uh, a lot different than there is today. You know, we went to training camp. We didn't have locks on the doors, you know, and guys could, you know, hang out at the bar. We didn't have social media. Um, but you know, there was a lot going on. Um, there was, a, uh, you know, I think, uh, I, I think Dom did a, a very good job, um, of being a player's coach and allowing guys to be themselves and bringing in talent, you know, um, you know, Carolina Panthers were put together in 95 and an expansion draft. And uh, they brought in a lot of free agents. They brought in a lot of, you know, of course there was some, some young talent that was drafted, but for the most part, there were a lot of older guys. And I stepped into a veteran team. I mean, you look at the guys that I played up, played with guys like Lamar Lathan, Sam Mills, Kevin Green, Brett Maxey, Eric Davis, you know, all these guys, you know, me, Kerry Collins and I was like these young guys on the team and with Howard Griffith who went out to um 
out to uh, the Broncos and, and help Elwell and those guys get Super Bowls out there. But anyway, so we had all these veteran guys, and, and, and Dom did a, I thought Dom did a good job. But, you know, we were a young organization, too. You got to remember that, you know, Carolina Panthers um, uh, were only a second, second year in existence. And so uh, they made a lot of mistakes. I think they let Dom go a little early. I mean, they felt like the team was getting away from him, from him and it was a little bit of the inmates running the asylum you know, so to speak. But, uh, um, you know, it, 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 I think that tends to happen sometimes. Um, and, but Dom did a great job. I think the, the players had a lot of respect for Dom. And, and when Dom went to Green Bay, well, actually he went to Houston, but uh, you know, eventually got back to his, his roots as a coordinator and brought in Kevin Green, who was, you know, uh, a player for us and now a linebacker coach with Green Bay. I mean, he really got back into what really made him great, and that was, you know, leading a good defense. We had one of the best defenses in the, in the uh, history of the NFL in 96 with, you know, Lamar Lathan and um, Kevin Green coming off the end and, you know, big defensive tackles. We had a front there, uh, big Mike Fox, and I, you know, I can't remember all the guys that we played with then, but, you know, having, um, you know, Sam Mills and um, – you know, all the guys that came in from Buffalo uh, that, that played with us, I mean, we just really had a, a really veteran defensive team, and, and he really got back to those roots when he got back into uh, into Green Bay. And a lot of good offensive talent on that team, too, Musa. Some of the receivers, uh, solely you got Mark Carrier and Wesley Walls and guys like yourself and Willie Green. Uh, any of those guys – basically take you under their wing or any guys that you remain close to that uh, really made your NFL transition easy? I would say, you know, yeah, Mark Carrier more than anything, um, uh, more than any other guy on the team was the one guy that I sort of, I watched a lot. You know, he wasn't necessarily the mentor type that, hey, young fella, you know, come here, let me teach you what I know uh, type of thing. And uh, so he wasn't that, he wasn't that way. Um uh, you know, Dwight Stone uh, was uh, one of the receivers. He was a guy that played at Pittsburgh for a bunch of years. I think he was a running back there and maybe played some receiver there, but he was our special teams kind of guru and did a little bit of everything. But I sat next to Dwight Stone in our first training camp meeting, and I noticed that Dwight Stone had all these different colored markers, right? It was like orange, red, green, blue. And he would color code every single route, every single receiver. He would take meticulous notes. And I got my note taken from Dwight Stone, you know, and, um, you know, I, I learned that the more you could do, the better you were. So I learned all the different positions. I even learned the tight end position, the running back position, the, all the different receiver spots because I really wanted to get on the field and I wanted to be able to help my team in any way. And so Dwight Stone was a guy that I learned, you know, um, how to take notes. And Mark was one that I learned just how to work hard and be meticulous when you worked and, and Willie Green was just, uh, I think he was anti-young guy, you know. And so, uh, you know, he, he would be the guy that says, oh, yeah, go ahead and take those reps, young fellow. You know, he'd take the, take the day off and not have to take, you know, double two or three times the, the reps that anyone else would be taking in practice. But, you know, those reps made me better. And, um, you know, we, we call Willie Green pork chop because he was Muslim, but he had a, he didn't have a Muslim name, so we we we, uh, we used to uh, you know crack jokes about him and call him pork chop. So you know pork chop was one of those guys, man. That uh, you know we got to be friends. You know I only played a couple years with him before he went to Denver, also with um, with Howard Griffith and a couple other guys. But uh, yeah, I did. I, I think I learned a little bit from each one of those guys, and um, you know, and, and it helped me out in my career. We're talking with Musa Muhammad here on Thursday night tailgating. Musa, a couple more before we let you go. And uh, as I was looking back over you know, your game stats, one of the best games you had came in your third season, 1998, second game of the year in New Orleans against the Saints. You had nine receptions, 192 yards, and a touchdown. And it wasn't like you had a, you know, a couple of 70-yard receptions to get to the 192. You had a bunch of 10- and 20-yard receptions that just built you up to the 192. What do you remember about that game? <laughs> I remember my coaches were upset with me and they wouldn't let me start the game. So most of my stats came in the second half. I mean, I got, I, I got in after the first quarter and I think I had you know, almost a hundred yards in the first, in the second quarter of the game. Um, but, uh, but then after that, they matched me up with, uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. He was kind of a short guy, um, but they matched me up with this guy and, and his nickname was Mighty Mouse. So maybe you guys can help me out a little bit, play for the Saints. Hmm. 
I remember his nickname was Mighty Mouse. Uh, and, you know, he was a you know, pretty good good corner, but he was much smaller than me. And um, um, I, I sort of patented the slant route in that game. I mean, I don't know how many slants I caught in that game, but it was just, you know, sort of back to back to back to back. Uh, and, you know, I just, you know, I just kept going with it. And so um, I, I remember, you know, just, you know, dragging him a little bit and, and, and really just, uh, you know, coming in that game and, and, and feeling good about myself. I, I, uh, I hadn't started up until that point. And my first two seasons, I battled some injuries. I broke my wrist one year and I thought I was going to be off to a great start. And that was my second year in the NFL. And my first year I had a setback with a hamstring injury. And so, you know, I was battling these injuries. And so, you know, when I finally, you know, started putting together a couple of good games and, and in a good year, uh, I really felt good about it. And so that was that first sort of breakout game for me. It was, uh, it was, it was great to have that victory. And, Moose, one more before we let you go. And I got to know, I saw your wife, Krista's post a few weeks ago that it was about to go down, the Pac-Man championship on the old Nintendo system. So who walked away Pac-Man champ? <laughs> she killed me, man. She killed me. <laughs> We've been, you know, we, <laughs> that's funny you guys have been. Well, she, uh, she, she is the Miss Pac-Man uh, queen, you know, and Pac-Man queen, but uh, we have a lot of fun, and you guys know we uh, we have uh, six children. Um, we have two adopted, four biological, and adoption is a big part of our lives. But you know, our family just has a, a, a great time. We have a lot of fun. Uh, I got a daughter right now that's playing basketball at Princeton. She'll be home next week, and um, you know, we typically do Secret Santa for you know the holiday season. And this year, we're going to have a scavenger hunt. Uh, we just have a lot of fun, and, uh, you know, every now and then, you know, she wins, she beats me. I, I have to concede, you know, we have good little championships. We like the card games, play dominoes, have fun as a family, and, and that's what it's all about, you know, and uh, just enjoying each other. Yeah, indeed it is. And, Moose, you've got an an event coming up in February called the Gift of Adoption Gala. Talk about what that event is is all about and how our listeners can get more information and get involved as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, th- this is uh, an organization that uh, uh, I helped found back in, the, uh, golly, this is several years ago, and we raised uh, money for uh, adoptions. And uh, basically, if, uh, you know, if, if you are interested in bringing a child into your home, uh, providing a, a home for a child, and for whatever, you know, purpose or whatever reason, uh, you know, some people can't have children biologically. Some people just have a very warm home um, and want to, uh, you know, open up their home for, for more children. And we know, guys, all the statistics around uh, children that grow up in a great environment with a great education and having opportunities um, and in a great family surrounding. So um, uh, we, we not only preach it, but we live it. We have to adopt a children of our own. Uh, so this fundraiser is to provide financial assistance because there's a huge hurdle uh, that when, you know, when people start to research adoption, they find that, hey, you know, may, we, we can't afford this, um, you know, and it stymies the progress and, uh, and, and it may be a deterrent for them. So uh, we assist families financially uh, through grants and they can apply uh, for those grants. Uh, through giftofadoption.org, and we are the Carolinas chapter. So uh, we have a gala on the 25th. It's our largest fundraiser. Um, You can donate online at giftofadoption.org and just click on the Carolinas tab, and and you can uh, either donate to this cause if if you want to feel like this is a worthy cause to donate for. Uh, You can do that, Um, or or you can apply for a grant um, if you are in the Carolinas uh, and you know, finances have been a, a hurdle in your quest to bring a child into your home. You know, you can uh, go online there and uh, and file for a grant. So uh, it's a great charity. Um, I think it fulfills a, a, a huge need, um, and uh, I'm just happy to be a part of it and we look forward to the gala. We have Greg Luganis is going to be our uh, our MC, and we usually have a family that uh, is a keynote speaker, but uh, Greg also has adoption as a part of his life, and uh, most of the people who are, you know, either speakers or MCs, you know, have 
uh, you know, some type of, uh, you know, adoption experience throughout their lifetime. So anyway, it's a great cause. Once again, it's uh, giftofadoption.org, and we are the Carolinas chapter. And our event is on uh, February the 25th, uh, 2017, coming up here. There you go. Moose, you've been uh, fantastic, as you always are. Remind our listeners how they can also follow you online and over social media as well. Well, you know, guys, I'm not the huge social media buff, but <laughs> I, I I do have a Twitter site, and it's uh, Moose Muhammad 87. Uh, it's at Moose Muhammad 87. And then um, I, I try to keep up some pictures on Instagram. And so it's the same thing on Instagram, at Moose Muhammad 87. And I have a you know pretty nice little Instagram. I try to update some pictures on there, but uh, – my wife is a social media buff. You probably can follow our family and all of our voyages. You know, we like to travel quite a bit, and so we put a lot of stories on there about what we do and where we go. And her name is Krista Muhammad, C-H-R-I-S-T-A-M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D, and she's always on Facebook, and, and, and we post quite a bit on her site on the social media. So uh, that's what we have, and uh, you guys can uh, follow along and be a part of our stories. There you go. Moose, thank you so much for coming back and being a part of the show again tonight. We hope you'll come back, you know, again real soon. You know, as we get closer to that event, we'd love to have you come back on and remind our listeners all about it. But uh, in between now and then, my friend, happy holidays to you and your family. Thanks so much, Chris and Bob. Thanks, guys, for having me on. Um, love to come back anytime. Just uh, give me a jingle. It's all, right. all right. Take Thanks. care, Moose. Thank you very much. We look right. forward to catching up soon. Okay, guys. Take care. Good night. That is uh, former uh, Panthers and Bears Pro Bowl defensive or Pro Bowl wide receiver Musa Muhammad and uh, Bob. You know, just what a wonderful guy Musa is, and just you know, not not only a great career, long great career, but a, just a, a, a top shelf guy. Another very eloquent guy, Chris, who does a lot for uh, the community and mankind in general. And you know what kind of family guy? We don't have to go over that but again what impresses me is how good he was kind of one of the more underrated guys to ever come down the pike Chris I I think I counted he had nine seasons 750 or more yards receiving of course he led the NFL in 2004 in TDs yards receiving and Chris this is a guy that never had a quote-unquote you know major major quarterback throwing him the ball and he, he, he caught 860 passes so uh, he had the he had Hall of Fame type talent, Chris. Uh, if again, if he had played with a, a maybe a little different cast of characters, Moose would be in Canton. But uh, hey, he'll be in our Hall of Fame someday, right, Chris? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah. What uh, a great guy. I love having Moose as part of the show. Is. All right, before we get to our next guest, Carrie Glenn, I want to give a shout-out to our good friend Renee Shell over at Career Engagement Institute. And, folks, if you're upside down in your career, and what do we mean by that? You're ready to move on, right? Go to careerengagement.institute to see how Renee can help you. You've heard some of our guests, Toy Cook, you know, singing Renee's praises the last time he joined us on the show. And if you work with Renee for two minutes, you're going to understand exactly why Toy did that and why we brag about Renee every single week here on Thursday Night Tailgate. We all want to work with someone that we can trust who actually has our best interest at heart. You know how rare it is to find someone like that. Well, no one fits that description any any better than Renee Shell does. She's a wonderfully talented lady, the kind of person you want to work with and have working for you. She's done some great things from some of our guests who have been in transition from being pro athletes and are now getting into the job market. So, folks, I'm telling you, she's just the very best. There isn't a better way to describe Renee than that. If you're an athlete or anyone in the job market, do yourself a favor and reach out to Renee. You're going to be so very glad that you did go to career engagement dot institute online and give her a follow on twitter at integrated play all right now back with us and making his seventh appearance on the kyvin foods guest line is <laughs> carrie glenn carrie has become a wonderful friend of the show he's always got some very passionate uh, opinions to share with us which is one of the many reasons why we enjoy having him on the show on a semi-regular basis let me remind you about carrie's background He's from East St. Louis, Illinois, played his college ball at the University of Minnesota, where he was teammates with one another, one of our good friends, Ricky Foggy. 
Kerry was a 10th round draft pick by the New York Jets in 1985, and he played defensive back in the NFL from 85 to 1992 for the Jets and the Dolphins. Was selected to the Pro Bowl in 1990 for his special teams play, leading the Dolphins in special teams tackles that year. Over the course of his career, he played in 74 games, had seven interceptions, two of which he returned for touchdowns, and he had two sacks, and we're glad that he is back with us again tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Carrie, Chris, and Bob, thanks for coming back on the show. Hey, Carrie. Chris, Bob, how are you guys doing? <laughs> hey, Chris, I have, a qu- I have a question for you, Chris, before we get started here. Um, All right. Now that, now that you're married, does the Christmas gift change? <laughs> does the Christmas gift change? Absolutely yes. not. <laughs> no. Because, I mean, because, you know, now, I mean, because, you know, cause, you, know you, you get married and everything, and then, you know, then she's like, hey, honey, I, I, I need the, a Bentley or uh, something like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if she's waiting for a I Bentley mean, carry, she's going to be waiting well, awfully I mean, long uh, time, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> no. I just want to know if it changes, so, so 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 she get the same thing. What she get a a, a, a perfume? Is that what you get? <laughs> no. Well, I, I I say no, but if, yeah, I mean, I got her perfume as part of the gift last year. Will I get her something like that this year if she asked for it? But you know, no, I mean, you know, no, we, we go. Hey, 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 Chris, this is what you do. Get her the same perfume from last year. <laughs> Get it the same thing. <laughs> and, and and what, Carrie? I mean, I, and then I end up with a terrible Christmas day. I get the cold shoulder no, the rest of the day. It, I mean, what? It, 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 I can't do it, that. It, 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 Help so, me out, so Carrie. If you do that, <laughs> so if you do that, what's going to happen? You're going to get a divorce. I don't want you to get a divorce. But that's what you get. You got to get her something. I'm a, but I, but I'm just, I, I tell you what. Let me help you out here. Because you're newly married. See. With me, the marriage thing just ain't, ain't working with me. So, I, I, you know, so, but I can tell you what you should do, though. I'm good. I'm good at the girlfriend thing. And, and, yeah. And and I tell you what. See, my girlfriend, she likes to travel. So, what I do, and she like to, and she like to go on cruises. Take your what? wife on a cruise. Take your wife on a cruise. Yeah. She's she never been that. on a cruise. Yes. Yeah. Oh, That's dude, good. dude. Oh, trust me. Listen, and you know what? You're going to get so many brownie points, you can never get in trouble. Is that right? <laughs> uh, I've, yeah. I've never been on a cruise, and I know you wouldn't stare me wrong, Carrie. No, man. Dude, you got dude, you got to take a cruise, man. Come on. All right. You, you, you got to, you know, right. you, you take, take, hey, look, this is what you do. Tell your wife, say, honey, you know what? You know, just, just get her a car and put it in there. We're going on a cruise. <laughs> he picked it, and then let and let her pick it out, and see, and you're gonna get all the brownie points in the world, cause you know that is a new husband gift. All right, it <laughs> sounds food, solid, right, Carrie? A lot of yeah, food. right. It is. I mean, it sounds solid. Yeah. That sounds like good, uh, good information, Carrie. I, I know you I've wouldn't hear me that, wrong, that, my friend. That, that 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 that's a new husband gift. I've I've been on uh, about uh, I'll probably say about thirty. I've been on wow. quite, a, quite. I've been on quite. I've been on quite a few cruises, dude. That, it, it, just, I mean, it's just something. you can go back. To, that's it. You can do the Eastern Caribbean, the Western Caribbean. You know, just make something really simple and easy. You know. Yeah. Um, Who's a good yeah, cruise so line? Uh, I, I like Carnival, and um, I mean, there's there's so many different ones out there. Uh, yeah. What, what I what I normally do, I've I've been on. I've, I've done a lot of Carnival. I've done a. Uh, um, uh, what was the other uh, cruise line? Because um, Carnival, uh, Royal, Royal, Royal Caribbean. Yeah, I've yeah. Been most, I, I've heard I, of that. I've been with, I, I, did, I did a lot with Royal Caribbean, and um, more cruises than anyone than than, than uh, Carnival. But, but yeah, but because right. I, I like I like their ships. I I, I, do, I, I I like their ships. They have they have some great ships and some huge, big ships, and and it's it's just fun. I mean, it's. Uh, I tell you, look, you gotta look into that. Look, look into taking your wife on the taking your wife on the cruise. I tell you something, it'll be, it'll be the be, it'll be the best gift that you gave her. All right, all right. I'll check out the Royal Caribbean, see what I can find. Appreciate see, the help, see, Carrie. Chris, Christmas, Christmas. See, now you're gonna be the best husband in the world. <laughs> Instead of the worst, because see, see, you gotta see now. If you're to follow my directions with the other gifts, see that that will make you the worst husband in the world. You give exactly. her the same. I can't you, have that. But or see or a 
around the time, but see what you should probably do too as well. If if she if she do something and she make you mad, you know you don't get mad. You just get her a bottle of perfume, the same bottle you bought her last year. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, then, and then and so and she so and so she if she make you mad, you get that. But if she's if she's if she's good, you take her on the cruise. If she's bad, to get her the perfume. So you gotta have two, uh-huh. you gotta have two gifts. But see, see, right. that, see, that's what I. See, that, see, for me, that's what I do for my girlfriend. I have, I have two gifts. I, I, you know, I, I go, well, you know. You get, you get the good if, girlfriend if good. gift and the bad girlfriend gift. Yeah. So, so if she, if she's good, she's good. She get the cruise. She get, she, whatever. Yeah. You know? But if she's bad, what I, what I do, you know, you know, I bought her some perfume. I just buy the same bottle of perfume, same size, everything. And I say, look, honey, perfume. <laughs> <laughs> Thirty cruises, Terry. There must be a lot of good in there. <laughs> yeah, oh, no yeah, kidding. yeah. I, I tell you something. Yeah, cruise. I tell you something. I love cruise. I've been, I've been doing it. Uh, I, I can't. I, I go way back in the in the nineties. For a while, I was doing like two and three a year. For a while. Wow. Yeah. 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 It's but it's fun. But, too, but you know, you know what? A lot of you get a lot of a lot of the senior citizens. They live on. You know what? It's, do you know what? It's cheaper. Uh, by day, day by day, to for a senior citizens to, to go on a cruise than to live into a, to live in a, a a home. Yeah, that's probably true. Sad but true. Oh, oh yeah, it, 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 oh yeah. When you look at it, when you look at it, and you break it down. It's and, and that's why you see a lot of these senior citizens taking these. That they, they take like a, a you know a twenty or forty day cruise or you know fifteen day cruise. I've, wow. I've done fifteen day cruises too. And it was all full of senior citizens. That, I mean, actually, that's where I met my I met my girlfriend on a 15 day cruise. Really? <laughs> yeah, ah, from, that's from, why. From Boston, from Barcelona. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Okay, what so, do you have for me tonight? Yeah, let's talk a little football. So, uh, Carrie, curious to get, kind of get your thoughts, you know, on on your alma mater, the University of Minnesota, guys. You know, had a you know a nice year, not 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 great, but a nice year. Curious to get your thoughts on uh, what you've seen from your alma mater. Uh, I mean, it, it, well, well, this is the this is the issue that I, I have. This goes back to the girlfriend again, okay? <laughs> she's wow. a bad she's she's a Badger fan. Every Ooh. every every year, she 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 puts on this this Badger this the baseball hat earrings. Put her sunglasses on and a and a badger shirt and and send that to me. I hate it. <laughs> I should probably get I should probably get her a bottle of shirt uh, uh get her a bottle of perfume for yes. Christmas. But <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, she's, yeah, she's being bad. But but no, she she do it every year. And you know what? Every year, I mean, every year they don't win. They always lose. I'm, I'm a I'm, I'm a little disappointed in them, uh, you know. But you know, they had a you no, know, they got a pretty good season. They, you know, they had a, they had a yeah. pretty good season. So I, I can't I can't really, you know, I mean I can't really say much you know, say about that. But when but I, I need them to win to win the axe back again. The axe right. we have to bring it back to Minneapolis next year. I mean, there's no if ands and buts about it. And um, but you know, and then she kind of turned me in and. and Another thing, she turned. She kind of, you know, if I'm not rooting for the University of Minnesota, now I'm always watching Bas- Badger football, and she she turned me into a Badger fan, so I'm a little upset over that too, as well. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, questions for Carrie? Yeah, Carrie, I want to take you back. Uh, of course, I've been to so many Jet games in my life, and I remember, you know, when you came up in '85 and and those teams back then, and and. I think you and I had talked before about a guy like Bud Carson who uh, has had so much success as a defensive guy, and then when they try to make the transition to a head coach, it's a totally different job, and they kind of get lost in that shuffle. But I think you were yeah. among those who consider Bud Carson a very, very bright defensive guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, when, when, it, when it comes to uh, a defensive guy, I mean, he, know, he knew his scheme. I mean, and 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 the one thing about it, and and what helps, and what hurts sometimes, what hurts a lot of these guys too, 
you know, you got to believe in the scheme. I mean, because after Bud, you know, Bud was, you know, when he was he was he was with the Jets, and then he went to Cleveland. When he went he went to Cleveland, then he brought me with him, and then Cleveland cut me. And when they cut me, I went right back to the Jets. I was only I was only unemployed for about a week. <laughs> but 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 yeah, I mean that's the one thing about it. But you know, and in Cleveland they just really didn't believe in the things that Bud was 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 saying. That's why he wasn't really successful there because some of the players, you know, some of the players they just really didn't believe in some of the things. Because Bud Bud would do some 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 awkward stuff. I mean, he would. I mean, Bud would sit back and just he would he would he would clear the field and blitz everybody. Mm. I mean, and and he, and 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 the corners. You man, you you the corners and the strong safety. You man to man. You know, if the if the line if, if the uh, if the running back come out, the linebacker would have to come off his blitz and, and you know go get the and get the the running back. But Bud would Bud would do stuff like that. And if you really didn't know how Bud was, you really don't believe in the things that he that he's doing. You'd be like, man, I can't, you know, I, you know, that, I mean, that, I, me as a rookie, I was afraid when he did this. And we was playing Cincinnati, and he did it. I was shaking in my boots, you know. But, but you know what though? We ended up winning the game. Why? Because he, I mean, he he bought the house. And and I tell somebody right now, Cincinnati could not. They, 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 Bud Bud shot every gap, and he said. Let them. If they, they, we have a guy that's going to be free. Let let them try to find that guy, and 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 that's what happened. And see, and see, a lot of these young guys too, they don't, they don't, they have to believe in it. And and and, and the reason I'm, I can say that, I was that person too, you know, when I first met Bud, and then Bud made me believe in him. But then when I went to Cleveland with Bud, then I came back to the Jets. They had a different coordinator mm-hmm. and and this guy was had some crazy <laughs> ideas too on some of the things that he, that, that that he wanted me to do but you know what you know me and him me and me and the the defense coordinator sit down we talk and he, and he just told me to say listen Carrie, let, let me let me just say this to you i see your talent but you just got to believe in me believe in what i'm calling and, and you know something? That's what some of these young guys have to do. They have to make sure because when you when you look when you look at them play on the field, a lot of them got the they, they got their nose in the backfield and all that stuff. If you're in the secondary, well, your position is I mean you know you in the secondary, you safety, corner, whatever whatever you may be. You can't be you know leave that line of scrimmage for those big guys up there. Now if somebody come in my secondary. Then that's when I have that's that's when I have to look up and see this person. But other than that, keep your eye on that receiver, and see. And that's why you see you see some guys getting open, you know, and all that. And and that's that's one of the things that's one of the things that you know that I you know when I talk to some of the young players, I say, I know sometimes you you, you think this because I did it when I was in, you know when I was in the league. But you just but you just have to believe in 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 in, in that coordinator and what he's doing. You believe in that, you're gonna see a totally different game. But when you don't believe in it, when you don't believe in what you're doing, and you you, you question it, you, you, your game you you can get beat, and you and you will get beat because you get, because you just don't believe in it. And Kerry, do you think? Uh, I know you keep your eye on the, the modern game. Do you think these DBs coming out of college now? were as prepared as you were back in the 80s. There just seems to be an awful lot of non-form tackling. It's a, more of a collision sport now. There's a lot oh. more holding than there used to be. What is your uh, idea about the modern defensive backs in the current game? Dude, I, I was I was just looking at the game tonight. Uh, a lot of these guys, if you, if, if, if you just look at it, it's exactly what, you, what you're saying. A lot of these guys, they trying to throw them, throw themselves a shoulder into a guy. Come on, right. you can't do that. Mm-hmm. You need to take your arms, you know, you know, form up and wrap your arms around him and hit him. That's what you need to do. I mean, and 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 I, I look at the game and I look at some of these guys and say, you gotta stop, stop trying to, you know, throw your little chicken wing out there mm-hmm. <laughs> because you can't. You know, I mean, these guys. I mean, these guys now. The bottom line to it is that these guys are big, they're strong, and they run big and strong and angry. 
I mean, you know, some trying to, you know, trying to drop a shoulder and hit him. That is, no, that's not going to work. It, it's absolutely not going to work. I mean, it, I think the, the, what some of these coaches need to do, and and and, and, I, and don't get me wrong, even with when I was, you know, I ain't going to say who it is. I ain't going to mention no names. But, you know, there, there was there was times when, <laughs> when I played with the Dolphins. There was, there was, there was some, some players, there were some players who, who, who well, I'm okay. I'm oh, screw it. I'm gonna mention names. Tim Tim McHire. <laughs> ah, yeah. Oh my God, Tim McHire is. A, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a funny story real quick. <laughs> we're playing. We're, uh, uh, we're, we're playing. Oh, I think it was the, the the Raiders. I think it was the Raiders. Bo, you know, Bo Jackson. <laughs> you know how he runs. <laughs> so, so we look at the film, and the coach, the coach goes, "Tim, you got, you got to throw your shoulder in there, man. You got to come on. You can't, you know, you can't just throw it." I mean, he said, "No, he said, Tim, wrap, wrap him up. You can't just throw your shoulder in there." <laughs> and, and, and Tim, like, "Shit, I'm not doing. I'm not breaking my neck." <laughs> The whole room, the whole room erupted, <laughs> and the coaches <laughs> turned the film off. He goes, "Tim, you got to make a tackle. You can't be doing it." And this, and the coaches and, and, and the Mel was so mad. Mel was like, "I tell you what, I'm gonna put you on. If you want to be on the field, you got to tackle. You can't tackle. You, you, I'm gonna bench you." <laughs> ben, Tim was like, "I ain't breaking my neck, and my mom's not gonna have my mom. He said, my mom's not gonna have to take care of me the rest of my life." <laughs> <laughs> my mom ain't not. She's not gonna have to take care of me the rest of my life. Uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> oh, Tim Tim McCall was funny. I said he he was funny. But you know, but, you know that that was Tim game. I mean that, that was Tim game. I mean Tim, Tim that he didn't. It, but now Tim could wrap up. He can hit you and wrap up when he want to. But he always he was one of those players that always liked to throw a little shoulder in there. And one time he hurt his shoulder doing that. So. Uh, but <laughs> but just um, funny. I mean, that, that was like after the, the, the after that, the coaches left the room, and they don't. They never, I mean, the, we, we ended up watching the film. The coaches just left the room. And, and they didn't even want to be around him. <laughs> hey, Kerry, one more before we let you go. But I'm I'm curious. You know, when you were in the league, and even now, you know, is is it a constant struggle? For you, when people, you know, either, you know, when you were in the league playing, obviously you're very recognizable. You know, when people recognize you today or they find out, you know, after talking with you that you played in the league, is it a, is it a struggle trying to figure out who's being real with you and who's trying to get in your pockets? Uh, well, you, you, I me personally, I, 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 um, I hang around – Good people, and and most of the, most of the things that I do, I, I do a lot of charity work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, when I'm when I'm here in Florida, uh, I'm I'm pretty much I'm I'm all over the place, and and all my friends have charities, and you know, people want me to have charities, no, but I don't do that. And and I and I like hanging around people, and those I mean that's pretty much the crowd that I kind of hang around with, and it's like the athletes and stuff. Um, I've had people who who hung around with me that didn't, you know, that they that's what they that's what they was there for, and um, and I I don't like that. I don't I don't I don't like people like that. I just like people to be mm-hmm. to be real because me personally I'm I'm real when I when I when I'm talking to someone I'm with someone I'm I'm real. I um, but you know you you can figure out who's who's fake and who's not fake. Yeah, I mean you 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 pretty much figure it out and but. But no, I don't. <clears throat> but what what I like to do, I, I like to have surround myself with good people, you know. And you know, when I go to church, that's what I do. I I, you know, I pray about that and make and just make sure that you know that the people that surround me are, are good people, because I you know I I want all of them to do um, be the excuse me be the best they can be, and 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 help out as as much as they can, you know, with the charities and things like that. Right. So Bob, you know what you got to do? You got you got to come down to Florida, man. We, you know, every you know, next year you probably come. You, you got to come down here, and and we we have like a clay shooting contest down here oh. with the NFLPA. Hmm. So you, you should come down here, man. We go we we go out shoot some uh 
these the clay targets. You know, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's nice. Hmm. Nice. Then, you know, Carry and, boof- yeah. We see you got to see Bob, see Bob, see Bob, because we got to get you guys a TV show, man. That's what we need to do. <laughs> Absolutely, please make that happen. Will you please, Carrie? Oh yeah. Hey, no, because I'm saying something. That's what we need to. We need we need to get you guys a TV show. Yeah. <laughs> We'd love for it to happen. I promise you that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Get you guys okay. a TV show. Bam. There you go. Right. <laughs> Carrie, before we let you go, remind our listeners how they can follow you over social media. Yes, uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, Carrie Glenn, and uh, Twitter is is Carrie Glenn 35, and and Instagram Car- is Carrie Glenn. There you go, Carrie. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. It's always so much fun for us when we get to spend some time with you. You're fantastic. Yes, we love <laughs> having you as part of the show, my friend. We do. Oh, I, I just like to have a lot of fun with you guys, man. It's just, it, you know, it, see, see for me, like I said, I'm, uh, you know, I'm back and forth here, and you know, and I, and I, and I I'm, I'm blessed to to be able to do the things that I can do. And uh, hey, hey, this is gonna be this is gonna be my first Christmas with my grandson. Cool. Ah, good for you, good for him. Nice. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's gonna be my first Christmas because I, I normally, I normally, uh, you know, I'm in Wisconsin this time of the year. Yeah. So, so the little lady, she she let me get away. I'm down here. <laughs> so, and so that's so next, awesome. So, so, Good so, for so, you. So, uh, so yeah. So I'm down. I'm down here, and then next, and then next, next year she she's gonna retire. She's gonna retire. So she's going to, and then so next year we'll be down here next year again. Because wow. of course she Good for of course you. she wants to. She loved the, she loved the hot the, the warm weather so. But guys, hey, thank you for having me on. Excuse me, I really appreciate it. And Chris, same keep, here, Carrie. Keep that in mind, you know. If she's good, she, you, you're Santa Claus, so you got to realize that. If she's good, <laughs> you take her on the cruise. If she's bad, you get her the same perfume you bought her last year. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind, Carrie. Thank you for the advice. I appreciate you, my friend. Merry Christmas, Happy right. Holidays to you and your family, Carrie. Yes, and thank to you guys. Uh, okay, all right, guys. I talk to you. Take care. Take care. Okay. Right. Bye bye. As his former Jets and Dolphins defensive back, Kerry Glenn. Solid advice. I love that Tim McHire story. I'm not breaking my neck. That's awesome. That's awesome. Seemed like a character, as is Kerry Glenn, Chris. We learned a lot about, uh, uh, my goodness, marriage counseling and uh, right and, and the travel industry. Chris, he the, the guy's multi talented and such a great guy. And uh, again, up here in New York, they loved him as a player. Uh, you know, a lot of interceptions uh, that you can get liked very much quickly here in New York, and he did that. And uh, as you can see, uh, as a zest for life and a very smart guy hanging in Florida about this time of the year, Chris. <laughs> That's right. All right, when Bob and I come back, we'll be turning on the Thursday night tailgate spotlight on the positive, hear which players are doing great things in their communities. We'll do that, then we'll wrap up the show, and we'll do it on the other side of these words from our friends over at Coastal Orthopedics and Kyven Foods. Are you suffering from ongoing pain from athletic injuries in your knees, shoulders, or hips? Tired of living your life with an old injury that just won't go away? If you answered yes to either of these questions, we can help. Dr. Peter Candelora and his experienced staff of medical professionals will get you back on the road to recovery. Their state-of-the-art facility and new medical technology will ensure you'll be enjoying life again in no time. Since 1991, Dr. Candelora has been specializing in joint replacement, athletic injuries, and general orthopedics. Visit us on the web at athleteinjuries.com or call our office at 888-825-1150. That is 888-825-1150. We're proud sponsors of the Gridiron Greats Assistance Fund. This is Reggie Kelly, former Cincinnati Bengals and Atlanta Falcon tight end. And I'm the owner of Kyvin Foods. And if you enjoy delicious food, you're going to love my Kyvin products, which consists of our honey apple salsa, sweet barbecue sauce, and an array of seasonings. For store locations, online orders, and recipes, check out our website at www.kyvin82.com. That's K-Y-V-A-N 82.com. One taste, and you'll appreciate the goodness. Hey, hey, welcome back. This is Todd Washington two-time Super Bowl champ, 
offensive line coach for the Baltimore Ravens. And you are listening to Thursday Night Tailgate with my boys, Chris Moscato and Bob Lazari on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Go get them, guys. We are back here on Thursday Night Tailgate, and we're turning on our spotlight on the positive. Bob, who do you have for us this week? Chris, so many times uh, at this time of the, the show, we've focused on guys from Green Bay because they're awfully close to their community, as you know, uh, the whole Lambeau thing. And uh, there's another guy, I don't know if we've talked about him in the past, but uh, I'm sure his name's come up. But we have to mention Jordy Nelson. I was doing a little research today, Chris. Of course, Aaron Rodgers, we've mentioned a lot. He does an awful lot for charity. But uh, Nelson, Chris, uh, he's involved in a, uh, he gets involved in this Christian nonprofit organization called Young Life. He's been doing it for at least five, six years, and uh, it started a couple years ago when he uh, had his own celebrity softball game, which drew 8,000 people, Chris, believe it or not. And uh, he raised over 100 grand that day to benefit Young Life. And uh, since then, he's done an awful lot of things, and he's done his own. He has his own Nelson Family Community Foundation. He does a lot with his own. Uh, he has his own family restaurant, Nelson's Landing, it's called, and uh, that does a lot of benefits for local families in need. Um, he does a lot of golf tournaments, and Aaron Rodgers comes down and helps him a lot, Chris, to do a lot of this stuff. So, got to really give kudos to both of those guys. But Jordy goes under the radar screen. Very, very uh, unassuming type of guy. And uh, actually, uh, back a few years ago, Chris, for his efforts doing things like this and for his on the field greatness. He had a Jordy Nelson Day in Kansas uh, by the governor of Kansas. So uh, kudos to him for all the things he does. He's getting a lot of headlines on the field with the resurgence of Green Bay now. But Jordy Nelson, Chris, he gets it done off the field as well. Nah, that's a great story, Bob. And it's you know it's interesting when you started with your intro talking about the Packers, and you know we we do our research independently and 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 come you know prepared for the show. We don't we don't compare notes very often and. And I thought you were going to go the same way because I got one of the Packers too. And I thought, Good. you know, at, at some point we we were bound to probably hit on the same guy doing doing great stuff. But uh, it's one of the Packers, but it's not Jordy Nelson. It's it's J. Ron Elliott who has been yeah. nominated for the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. And uh, earlier this year he won the Green Bay Area Community Service Award. Back in 2013, and this this guy's been doing so many great things over the course of you know the last several years, and you'll see year after year he's always being nominated for something. 2013, he won the Community Service Award in Toledo, which is where he attended college. He went to the University of Toledo. So Bob, you know, you kind of get the idea. This guy is you know you know makes a lot of you know big community impacts everywhere he goes, and he doesn't focus, Bob, on any one organization. He does it you know across many many organizations. He visits schools around the Green Bay area, spreading the word about being respectful to others and the importance of education. He participates in the NFL Play 60 movement and assists youth football camps. Last, you know, last offseason, he was one of six Packers to participate in the Packers tailgate tour, and they travel around to five cities in central and, and southern Wisconsin, raising money for local nonprofit agencies. He's participated in the, in the Packers Give Back Celebrity Bowling event that helped benefit the Northeast Wisconsin Technical College Student Emergency Fund and has been a supporter of the March of Dimes by donating a dinner that helps bring in awareness to support, you know, to support that organization. So, you know, he gets there and, and he donates a dinner with himself and other players and, and, and they raise money that way. And you know, also, you know, going all the way back while doing an internship at Arizona State, he spoke to students there at uh, you know at a local high school. Again, talking about you know being respectful and, and giving back to the organ, you know giving back to the communities and and you know doing things for children. And during his visit to his hometown in Cleveland, Ohio, recently he made it a priority to go visit the local boys and girls club there because you know that impact that organization impacted his life when he was growing up. So, I mean, the list just goes on and on, Bob. He's a regular at the Packer Partners uh, fan club events that, you know, gets involved with, you know, speaking to students and uh, at, at local uh, local uh, elementary schools. So he's a part of that. You know, he, he's a part of an alternative education program designed to help at-risk youth. He's attended the Children's Heart uh, Foundation golf outing and the uh, First Breast Cancer Award Awareness uh, for high school football where, where they bring Bring in and take proceeds from high school football games to benefit the American Cancer Society. But the guy just does so much and has been doing it for so long. So kudos to J. Ron Elliott for making a positive impact in, in so many ways. A lot of great stuff from him, Bob. 
It is amazing, Chris. And, uh, again, uh, this guy had it in him before he reached Green Bay, but it uh, just seems something about that Green Bay and the close-knit community. Uh, maybe it's the way they draft, Chris. I don't know, but there's a lot of good that comes off that organization. Yeah, no, exactly right. So, you know, kudos to two Packers, Jordy Nelson and J-Ron, uh, J-Ron Elliott for uh, for the great things that they are doing in and around the Green Bay area and, and so many other places as well. And, folks, those are, those are uh, you know, two of the stories, like, you know, we, we try to bring you every single week on this segment to let you know, you know, players, you know, current players, former players doing great things to have a positive impact on uh, on people in their communities and sometimes all around the world as well. All right, Bob, it is time for us to put a bow on this episode of Thursday Night Tailgate. We want to send out our thanks again to Billy Sample, Tony Collins, Lito Shepard, Musa Muhammad, and Carrie Glenn for joining us tonight. And, Bob, thank you as well, my friend. Always a, a great time getting to spend my Thursday nights with you. Uh, here, same here, Chris. That was a lot of fun, a lot of laughs, and uh, we also learned a lot tonight, which we always do, and that's uh, one of the advantages of doing this show. Exactly right. All right, next week, who do we have scheduled to join us? Well, former Steelers offensive lineman turned master craftsman John Malecki will be back with us, as will uh, another former Jets defensive back, Victor Green, will be back with us here on the show. Another good friend and former Giants and Chiefs defensive back, Mark Collins, is going to be here. And uh, former Broncos and uh, Falcons running back, Gene Lang, going to make a return visit with us as well. And then, of course, we've got Tony Collins to, uh, to join us for our five-star picks of the week. So we've got a, another great show on tap for you next week. We hope you'll come back and be a part of it. How can you follow us? on social media well please visit us on facebook uh, we have a, the, the thursday night tailgate page you can interact with us there plus bob and i both have our own facebook pages as well please give us a like on our on our uh, on our show facebook page that's very important to us as well on twitter you can follow me at ct mascaro bob is at bob underscore lazari and the show is at tnt podcast you can stream or download any of our archive episodes for free folks on great podcasting sites like we talked about earlier our great friends over at podbean They've been so wonderful to us, recommending our show, having us in their banner ads, featuring us on their mobile app as well. Can't thank them enough for doing that. You can also stream the show on iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Blog Talk Radio, Spreaker, Stitcher, Audioboom, Player.fm, SoundCloud. We're all over the net. So you can take us with you everywhere you go and, uh, and stream us, whether it's on your smartphone or you can stream us online as well. Please check us out. And uh, if you've got a favorite app or a favorite site and we're not on it, let us know. We'll try to get on it uh, on it there for you as well. Bob, take us home, my friend. And thanks, Chris. And remember what Kerry said: take her on a cruise. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I think he made that clear to you. But uh, again, many thanks to our announcer Joe Lajanusa for the great job he does with our weekly intro and ads, and to James Brocato and all the guys from Painted Faces for our upcoming outro music. On behalf of myself and Chris. We thank everyone tonight for listening. We appreciate you the most. Until next week, good night, Kevin. We miss you.